teeth is not going to work. And talking of holes, potholes. We've got an eight-year backlog. On, we've, we've got more pet potholes now than we had eight years ago. That's what I'm trying to say. We'll have worked it out by the time we talk about Show it. Show us the ones near you. <laughs> We'd like to see them. Send your pictures in. GB News, GBNews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. Should we put tobacco star warnings on ultra processed foods? Boris Johnson is calling on the government to do this. In his Daily Mail column, the former Prime Minister says that people don't know what they're feeding their families and there's too many extra ingredients. That's why I'm asking, should we put tobacco star warnings on ultra processed food? Well, joining me now to discuss Steve Miller, former presenter of Fat Families, Helena Davidson, campaigner and policy expert at the Vegan Society. Right, so I'm going to start with you, Steve Miller. What do you think? Oh, I'm applauding Boris today. Good on you, mate. Uh, and the reason for that is we know that the research on uh, cigarette, you know, the warnings on cigarettes, I should say, when those warnings were visual, they worked very well. The second reason on a practical level is that we need to start stop looking and listening before we start, you know, grazing and putting mm. things in the trolley. And the third thing is that you know, these kind of signs, or these warnings, I should say, are kind of hypnotic. They trigger the emotion. So they're much more likely to get people to think and, and maybe resist. Yeah, so the, at the Vegan Society, we're broadly in favour of increasing consumer knowledge um, when it comes to the nutri nutritional value of people's food. Um, but I think it's important to mention that ultra-processed food isn't an issue that's exclusive to vegans. And whilst most meat alternatives will fall into the ultra processed food category, it largely depends on how we're going to look at how UPFs are going to be assessed because vegan um, alternatives that are fall under ultra processed foods, they're actually on average healthier than meat products or ultra processed foods that contain animal products. Really? So I think it depends on how we look at it. We might have to take a closer look at the nutritional profile of individual foods rather than the level of processing. Good morning, 9.30 on Tuesday the 19th of March. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. So, photographs of the Princess of Wales out and about over the weekend have been released They're on the front page of The Sun, but there are still some super sceptics online who don't believe it's her. And Nigel Farage is in Florida where he's interviewed former President Donald Trump. You can see it tonight at 7pm only on GB News. Here's a sneak preview. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. OK, let's get out of here. i got to go back to work. <laughs> Join me tonight at 7 o'clock on GB News. The full interview with Donald J. Trump. And how bad are the potholes where you live? Roads around the country are at breaking point. It's the worst that they've been for eight years. And Aaron Taylor Johnson, have you heard of him? Me neither. Well, the Hollywood actor best known for his role in the Marvel films, looks like he is the new James Bond.
must say, I appreciate that last lingering shot there. Yeah, but I can't. Him. I can't think of a single film he's been well, in. Well, that's the female editor and director of the show. Can you? Can you think of a single film he's been in? No, I don't know anything that he's been in. His wife is more famous than him, actually. Yeah. She's Sam Taylor Wood, as she was. Was she married him, Sam Taylor Johnson? And in fact, she directed a film I was looking up online for International Women's Day. It was James Bond tribute ah. to International Women's Day. What did she know then? Uh, get in touch with us this morning. GBviews at gbnews.com, particularly to tell us your reaction to finally seeing the pictures of the Princess of Wales out and about at the farm shop buying her bread. First, though, here's the very latest news with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Bev. Good morning. It's 9.32. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your headlines... The Prime Minister faces a fresh battle with the House of Lords over his Rwanda bill after a victory in the Commons overnight. MPs rejected all ten amendments, one of which was designed to ensure the bill complies with domestic and international law. The controversial legislation aims to deter illegal immigrants from coming to the UK on small boats by deporting them to Rwanda. Downing Street says the initial cohort of people is now being contacted and the Prime Minister is determined to get flights off the ground in the spring. Labour will seek to bring a new chapter in Britain's economic history. The Shadow Chancellor will promise in a speech this evening. Rachel Reeves plans to reform the Treasury in, if Labour wins the government as part of her economic policy. Addressing finance leaders at the annual May lecture in the City of London, she'll liken the economic challenge awaiting the next government to that that faced by Margaret Thatcher. The speech comes after Ms Reeves said Labour would not be able to turn things around straight away if voted in. Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A report found just 47% of local road miles were rated as being good with 36% adequate and 17% poor. The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils were expected to fix 2 million potholes in the current financial year. That's up 43% on the previous year and the highest in annual total since 2015. And the Princess of Wales has been filmed smiling and looking happy while out shopping with Prince William. It comes after the couple have faced weeks of social media speculation surrounding Catherine's health and whereabouts. Now the Sun newspaper has published the pictures and a video of Prince William and Princess Catherine strolling through a car park on Saturday at a Windsor farm shop close to their home. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. Very good morning. Welcome to Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. So we've moved on from the conversation yesterday. The story about uh, Princess of Wales at the Windsor Farm Shop, her favourite Windsor Farm Shop, the Sun had no photograph. We talked about had they chosen not to run a photograph, did not have one. Now they have mm. the follow-up, the world exclusive, they're calling it. It's a video of Kate and William leaving the farm shop. She looks pretty good. She looks great on the picture. Um, we can't show you the video because, of course, the Sun do have exclusive yeah. uh, rights to it. It was just shot by an onlooker, yeah. um, a customer in the same um, farm shop, and it should have put all of the rumours to rest that she wasn't OK or that she'd disappeared or she was off sulking somewhere. Um, she looks very happy. I believe that is her. Don't I worry. believe that is William. Obviously, there are a lot of super sceptics online, and I do tend to like a super sceptic, but I think in this situation yeah. they are wrong. This is clearly her. She looks very, very thin. And let's be clear, too, the Palace will not be displeased by this because they know if a couple like that are out and about, people always take photographs. Yeah. People have got mobile phones, haven't they, the whole time? And after the, the miss... The, the, the misfired mm -hmm. Mother's Day photograph. This is looks very nice. She looks happy. You've got to say she's looking a bit thinner than she last did, but she of has course. had major surgery, so would, you wouldn't expect anything else. I tell you, the, the bit I do find a little bit strange is the fact that she's carrying the bag of shopping. I think You've that's to show a... that she's fit. Ah, uh, you don't think that's accidental? No, no, no. All stage managed, down to the last second, I would think, for sure. Oh. And it's probably only a bag of... It's probably only a loaf of bread. Yes. And William's, and William's holding something too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's showing that um, 
working mum, and then she's been me going back to the house yeah. to do lunch. Great. You know, does this put your mind at rest at home? GBviews at gbnews.com is the email address. Do you want this picture to have been released? Are you happy to see this? Do you just want us to stop talking about it? Let's talk to Jonathan Coad, who's a media uh, lawyer. Good morning, Jonathan. Thank you very Good morning, much. Good morning, Beb for joining us. So obviously there's this relationship, isn't there, between the British press and the royal family. A lot of it is kind of unwritten rules of respect and courtesy from the press to the family. So what kind of conversations would have been going on, do you think, as a, as a media lawyer in order for the paper to run this? Because it wasn't taken by a paparazzi. Well, I know the in-house legal team at The Sun. They're three very good guys. Um, and they won't, I'm sure, not only thinking about the technical issues of the IPSO code, Independent Press Science Organisation mm -hmm. code and the law, but knowing them, they'll also be thinking, you know, what would we think is right and wrong? But from a legal point of view, there's not the slightest problem. Uh, this, this, the dear um, Princess Catherine is walking in an open space. Mm. I'm quite sure that, the, that Kensington Palace knew perfectly well that the likelihood is, as you say, everyone's got a mobile phone now, that that this would be captured on film by somebody. The Independent Press Standards Organisation Code, which the Sun has to comply with, has a privacy section, uh, it's clause two. Um, I, I've sent that over to your, your guys, uh, and you, as you can see, there's no breach of the privacy, uh, privacy code in the Independent Press Standards Organisation's um, way of thinking. So from a technical and regulatory and legal point of view, they haven't done anything wrong. Mm. And, Jonathan, this is a couple that know wherever they go, somebody's got a camera, uh, whether it's a phone or, or a video camera, and uh, I suspect, can't be 100%, but knowing how the palace operate, they will be not dis displeased that this is now getting wide currency around the world. And while there is still some people going to say, oh, it's not her, most people now, I suspect, this is going to put their minds to rest. She's well on the road to recovery. Well, um... I would be astonished if it wasn't assumed by the good folk at Kensington Palace that this footage would be taken and would emerge. And I'm quite sure that, therefore, that they're, they're happy. Now, I have watched the eight-minute section on the Sun website, and it's extraordinarily supportive. Um, there's nothing embarrassing or intrusive said. Uh, they're, all, they're all very appreciative of, of Princess Catherine. They're all delighted that she's well. They're all making the point that uh, we, we aren't, we can't expect to know everything about her medical details. That's absolutely right. So all in all, you know, and this is from someone who's a regular critic of the tabloid newspapers. It's a thumbs up from mm. me uh, to the Sun on this one. They 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 aimed to be a blessing to Princess Catherine, and I'm mm. sure that's how it be treated. Jonathan, how does it work in this situation? If you're a layperson, as the customer was at this farm shop, and they've got their phone out and they've taken this footage. Do the son then buy the picture off that individual and then retain ownership and continue to sell it? Because this will have made the paper quite a lot of money around the world, I would imagine. Well, yeah, it will have made stacks of money. And, and certainly the fact that there's there's footage. I mean, the footage, they've turned this into an eight-minute programme, the son, but the footage itself is, I don't know, about 12, 15 seconds, something like that. But absolutely right. The expression that's used uh, in the tabloid world is you buy it up. So they bought up the uh, they bought up the footage, and indeed, you're quite right. They will have made a, a fortune um, around the world using the footage. But you know, it, it's a commercial organisation, the Sun. There's no reason why they shouldn't do that. Uh, the only slight irony I would say about the Sun is that they're very keen on ensuring that their own intellectual property rights are not infringed. Mm. They're not quite so careful about the intellectual property rights of other people. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting as well, Jonathan, that TMZ, which is the tabloid uh, showbiz uh, agency in America, have also bought this video, which is a reflection, frankly, of how big a story mm. this has been across the, uh, across the water, huge in America. Well, well, yes, uh, and we have, you know, in the Prince of Wales, Princess Wales, two absolutely lovely people. Mm. With, with Princess Wales, bless her. I mean, a film star looks, a lady of great, great grace and and gifts, uh, and we're very fortunate to have them. So, you know, and I, I suspect a lot of the American folk wish they had a royal family rather than Donald Trump or uh, Joe Biden. Quite. So mm. it's it's not surprising that they are. Um, 
very popular in the States, and it's not surprising, therefore, that this footage has done good business. OK, thank you, Jonathan. Lovely Jonathan, to talk to you. Jonathan, co there, media lawyer. Can, let me just... Can I yeah. ask you, Andrew? Yeah. Um, will the, the fact that this is sort of commodifying Kate to yeah. some degree, yeah. will, will, will there have been difficult conversations about that with the newspaper? Because the, the times have changed, haven't no, they? No, no, because they would argue, without a doubt, this is in the public interest. Um, a lot of people talk... Everyone's talking about it. Worldwide interest. The Palace have got no objection to this. Yeah. And... They have got a newspaper to sell. This will sell a newspaper, but also this is also about their online reach. Yeah. Because people will be going online and saying, mm. to see this video, uh, and uh, mm. and and it's huge. Look, let's talk to Ian Lloyd, who is a royal biographer and taken photographs of the royal family for years. Ian, if you'd been by that farm shop as she walked out with William, Prince William, you'd have gone to heaven and died all in one go. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, anybody would. I mean, it's it's um, it's quite an interesting place to have seen them because it's sort of semi-public. I mean, the public access it through the road from Datchet and Old Windsor. Uh, the royal family access it through their estates, so it's about um, a mile from uh, their house, Adelaide Cottage. They just drive past the royal burial ground at Frogmore, and then. Uh, uh, and then enter the back of the farm that way. So it's it's sort of semi-private. It's the equivalent of popping to the local shop for a pint of milk, really, I think. Um, sorry. I, no, I was just going to say, you photographed these, this family for years. How do you think she looks? Um, I think she looks great. I mean, it's quite interesting. She's, there's no attempt to disguise her. I mean, mm. um, I mean, William's got the cap, you know, pulled down. And quite often in, in that brief moment when somebody walks past you, you think, is that them? You know, because yes. celebrities never look in the flesh like they do on the television mm. or in the newspaper. So there's always a moment when you think, you know, is it them or not? I suppose the fact there's probably back, um, you know, police people with them and, and a, a Range Rover would give it away. But, uh, I mean, there's no attempt to disguise her. And, and um, if you look at the video, she's walking very briskly and looking very well. So um, I think she she would have gone with the expectation of being seen and possibly yeah. photographed. And, yeah. and as you say, it, it's not probably a bad thing at the moment because we, it uh, allays all the fears, you know. We were just talking, in about the, like, the, the change in the culture of the relationship between the royals and the way that they uh, distribute images of themselves. Of course, there was a time when there would only ever be a formal photographer to take photographs, and Kate has certainly set the precedent of wanting to take those herself. Sometimes it works very well. Sometimes it backfires, as we saw with the, the picture released for Mother's Day. What do you think they should do in this modern world in terms of curating the imagery that the public see? It's difficult because um, when I was mainly a photographer in the 90s and noughties sort of thing, and there was a division. You were press because you had a press camera and you were public because you had a little tiny one of those, you know, sure shot things that you just um, pushed and clicked sort of thing. Um, now everybody's a potential mm -hmm. photographer and um, they realise that even if there's no press, as they weren't at the, sh the shop, that, 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 that anybody can get a, a creditable image, you know. So it's very difficult for the royal family, and particularly, I think, for William, because he's determined that um, um, we won't slide into this situation that we had with Diana, because, uh, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, and perhaps you are, Andrew, the um, the bit when, when Diana went shopping in Tetbury and got uh, uh, lots of uh, upset from the royal family, and the Queen called all the editors of the, the day into a meeting at Buckingham Palace and... Uh, I remember it was the, the the editor of the News of the World said, well, why can't you just send somebody out to go and get her wine gums? And the Queen said, that's the most pompous remark I've ever heard, you know. <laughs> um, she was... Um, they were worried about it 40 years ago, so, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and it, even worse, as I said, because it's the public doing it now. But that that... That relationship is very important, isn't it? Because you look at Harry and Meghan and they've got it so wrong with the press because they've tried to control their output almost too much, would you say, yeah, rather yeah. than collaborating with yeah. the media? And the, the, the best person in the royal family I ever photographed was the Queen Mother and she had an instinctive um, mm. understanding of, of the power of, of photography and the press. And I was once taking a photograph and she said, you know, uh, somebody tried to stop them and, and she said, well, you know, behind that camera there is two million people. Mm, and yeah. She didn't mean taking the photograph, she meant the people that would see that pit photograph mm. in the paper the following day. Um, the, and the one that's getting it right at the moment is, oddly enough, Camilla, who's been through, you know, years ago, quite a lot of hassle with mm. photographers. I remember people chasing her in London through uh, at an engagement and... Uh, 
quite horrible for her. She had to dive into a taxi, but she understands it as well. And she's there's no hassle, there's no problem with her, and she's left alone. So I think you've got to kind of cooperate at the same time okay. as it's um, got to be about visibility, it. hasn't it? It's got to be about visibility. They've got to be seen. That's it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And and also, if you if you if you are always happy, always relaxed, always smiling, like the Queen Mother was, and like Camilla is. You get a good press, don't you? I mean, yeah. you know, if, if you're looking yeah. like, you know, tortured and... Do you remember that thing yeah. with Harry and yes. Meghan when they yeah. were in okay. car chase and all of that? All right, thank you, know. you so much, World Bank and former photographer Ian Lloyd there. Now, later on this evening, Nigel Farage Ooh, has an exclusive wait. interview with former president and possible future president uh, Donald Trump. We're going to show you a sneak peek in a moment before playing out the full thing at 7 o'clock tonight. But stay here for a little bit of an exclusive. You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Welcome back to Headliners. And Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old fashioned traditional mail breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Row as hospitals say hormone filled milk from trans women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because, you know, when ho hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And uh, before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. And I want to shame this hospital. This is... This necessary. Yeah, yeah, let's do. Hospital Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences I have read God, Josh, aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yeah. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at nine thirty when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Very good morning, 9.50. Nigel Farage is in Florida at the moment. He's interviewed former president and possible future president, Donald Trump. It's apparently no holds barred. Here's a sneak peek. Join me tonight at 7 o'clock on GB News, the full interview with Donald J. Trump, and he makes it absolutely clear. He's running. He believes that he is going to win. Prince Harry may not be able to stay in America if Trump gets elected. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. He's accused, according to a bloodshed, if he loses. But actually, the context of that is all completely and utterly wrong. It's going to be a terrible bloodbath for the auto industry. The United Auto Workers, it's going to be put out of business. And importantly, for global security, we get 
tonight, the definitive answer on where Trump stands on NATO. This has global significance. Why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money, but now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two or three weeks ago? This is an interview you will not want to miss tonight, exclusively on GB News at 7 o'clock. Join me. Well, Trump I'll be to it. The Trump handshake. He, he shakes Nigel's hand and he just pulls it off. It's a bit of a power play. Did you see that? Yeah. Even though they obviously get on very well. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, and the polls are looking like he's going to be the president of the United States. Uh, and, of course, he's talking about Prince Harry. Yeah. And his passport. Uh, did he fib on his visa application over his drugs? That's right. NATO will be huge. Yeah. And, of course, there'll be all the politics about how dreadful Joe Biden is. OK. Well, joining us now is Professor in International Politics, University of Birmingham, David Dunn. Good morning, David. Um, Andrew... Good morning. Kind of summing up there, the main themes here. Um, what do you expect him to talk about which could have significance across the world? I particularly want to see where he stands on the Ukraine issue. Well, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the key question here is his comments with regard uh, to NATO. And in that uh, brief clip there, again, you heard him repeating the notion that actually uh, the, uh, if... Um, countries didn't pay, that, then why should we protect them? And of course, that, that strikes at the whole basis of the NATO alliance, which is an attack on one, is an attack on all. And that represents the bipartisan consensus in American foreign policy for the last 70 years, which Trump seems to indicate that he wants to tear up. And further than that, didn't he? Didn't he imply, Professor, that um, if they don't pay up, then if Trump, if, if Putin attacks uh, people in NATO, their own fault, their own problem. Well, that's not the way that NATO works. It's not like joining a country club. It's not a question of paying up. A states make a commitment to a very strange of defence uh, uh, commitments to the alliance, including uh, from the NATO uh, Wales Summit, a 2% uh, goal of, of GDP. But there's different ways to measure the, uh, the, the contribution. Uh, the, the Germans, for example, make an international contribution uh, through having a, a massive uh, age budget, uh, much larger as a percentage of GDP uh, than the United States does. Uh, other countries have conscription, and therefore, even though they may not have as many, uh, much money spent, mm. their overall contribution is larger. So it's more a question of judging the, the, the whole things as a whole. But American leadership of the West, and it has been uh, allowed to be the leader of the, of the West for 70 years, and uh, largely had support of uh, the alliances around the world, has been on the basis that, that actually America makes a commitment to international solidarity and security uh, through those alliances, and it's not done on the basis of, 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 uh, of whether they meet it per capita. David, the David yeah. let, okay, let me ask you, you, you teach international politics at the University of Birmingham. What yeah. do your students think of Donald Trump? Is he a figure of fun to political students in this country? He's more a figure for my students, uh, international politics students, is more a figure of concern rather than fun. Uh, they re recognise the deadly serious uh, uh, issues that, that Trump represents. I mean, on a whole range of issues. He's talked about aiding all aid budget. America's the biggest aid donor in the world. He's talked about putting 100% tariffs on, on an import of cars. That for the UK, JLR. One of the biggest markets is America. 100% tariffs would have a major impact on that. Mm. He's talked about having 10% tariffs across the board. That will be massively damaging transatlantic trade. Mm. Uh, European security, I say the bipartisan consensus, is, yeah. is one that has been, has David, been attacked. I'm so the best students are very well, concerned about. I hate to interrupt you. I could have listened to you all day, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. Confirmation there that most of British students are very left-leaning as well, I think we can safely say. Okay. Uh, don't go anywhere. Trumpy. Up next. He is Marmite. We're Trumpy. going to be crossing to the Senate in Cardiff, where Mark Drakeford will officially step down later today. Good. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of Weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Bit of rain around this morning, first thing, but most of us will have a, a kind of brightening up sort of day with some bright or sunny spells later and not too much rain by this afternoon. Even this morning, the rain is fairly well scattered, but some pretty heavy showers across northern Scotland with a gusty wind and a smattering of showers over parts of England and Wales, particularly the Midlands, northeast England. We'll see a few more of those through the afternoon, but I'm hopeful for something a bit brighter for uh, Wales, western Scotland, 
Auckland and even further south there'll be some bright spells which could see temperatures get to 16, 17, maybe 18 Celsius so that's pretty mild for the time of year feeling colder with a stiff wind over the far north of Scotland. That'll ease a little as we go through the nights and then more rain comes into Wales and southwest England so things turning damp here through the evening that rain will spread into the Midlands and Northern Ireland as we go through the night and eventually into southern Scotland with all the cloud and the outbreaks of mostly light rain won't be a cold night. Temperatures in the south staying in double figures in some towns and cities. A dull, dank, drizzly start then for Wednesday morning, certainly over the Midlands, North Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern Scotland. Most of the south, uh, again, largely dry and much of Northern Scotland having a fine day on Wednesday. Some decent spells of sunshine for the Highlands, brightening up too across uh, Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease, but many places will stay fairly cloudy tomorrow. A cooler day as a result, but still pretty mild in the southeast. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, haven't well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink. <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the Just fence. chilling, just yeah. relaxing. Uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex Fire and Rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, uh, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver, and Danielle joined us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through, we've followed them, and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine, he's, he's, he's on his phone, um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, he's on the phone to the, the, the sort of the emergency crew in panic, thinking he's going to sink. Um, so we could not just sit there and watch. Um, he's absolutely terrified. Yeah, poor bloke. Well done, you. Do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad? It is, because although I do sympathise with them, they are so red-taped, but surely sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door. Very good morning. It's 10 o'clock on Tuesday, the 19th of March. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and me, Beth Turner. Photos and videos of the Prince of the Wales out and about over the weekend have been released. Some people, though, still don't believe it's her. Our very own Nigel Farage is in Florida right now. He's interviewed former President Donald Trump. It's being edited as we speak. You can see it tonight at 7 o'clock only on GB, GB News. Here's a quick look. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. OK, let's get out of here. i got to go back to work. <laughs> Join me tonight at 7 o'clock on GB News. The full interview with Donald J. Trump. 
So the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, is officially and finally stepping down this afternoon after five years in the job. Our reporter, Catherine Forster, is outside the Senate. Yes, welcome to Wales, where it's a historic day. Mark Drakeford's final First Minister's questions, Vaughan Gething due to become First Minister tomorrow. There's a bit of a row brewing here, though, and I will be talking shortly to Andrew R.T. Davis, the leader of the opposition. And the government unveiled its £200 million plan to bolster NHS dentistry in England last month, do you remember? But according to a new poll, dentists overwhelmingly say that it will not help patients and it might even make things worse. We'll tell you why. And have you heard of Aaron Taylor Johnson? Because you will do, the Hollywood actor best known for his role in Marvel films. It looks like he is the new James Bond. And potholes. Oh, yeah. Potholes, it's the kind of stuff that keeps me awake at night, honestly. Let us know your thoughts this morning. GBviews at gbnews.com. How bad are the potholes they're where like, you live? Some, in some places, they're like craters. <laughs> they are, which is all right. It's sort of all right in a car. If you're a cyclist, we're all being told to get on our bikes and leave our cars behind. Please make the road safe enough to cycle on. If you're going to do that, please. Um, let us know your thoughts this morning. First, though, your very latest news with Sophia Wensler. Bev, thank you. Good morning. It's two minutes past ten. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your top story this hour. The Prime Minister faces a fresh battle with the House of Lords over his Rwanda bill after a victory in the Commons overnight. MPs rejected all ten amendments, one of which was designed to ensure the bill complies with domestic and international law. The controversial legislation aims to deter illegal immigrants from coming to the UK on small boats by deporting them to Rwanda. Downing Street says the initial cohort of people is now being contacted. Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser says the government is still determined to see the flights departing this spring. Uh, we saw um, those, those uh, amendments all fail in the House of Commons last night with strong majorities. Uh, obviously, it will go back to the Lords, but you know, what we are doing as a government, as a Conservative government, is trying to ensure that we deter people from taking that journey. We want to see illegal immigration down. We want to see uh, people not making that crossing. And we do think that this bill uh, will be a significant deterrent for people uh, who would otherwise cross the Channel. Labour will seek to bring about a new chapter in Britain's economic history. The Shadow Chancellor will promise in a speech this evening. Rachel Reeves plans to reform the Treasury if Labour wins the government as part of her economic policy. Addressing finance leaders at the annual May lecture in the City of London, she'll liken the economic challenge awaiting the next government to that faced by Margaret Thatcher. The speech comes after Ms Reeves said Labour would not be able to turn things around straight away if voted in. Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Darren Jones, outlined Rachel Reeves' plan. We are on the cusp of an opportunity in this country, an opportunity for a decade of national renewal where we can get growth back into our economy, make people better off um, and start to turn the page on 14 years of failure from the Conservatives. If Labour is to win the election later this year, uh, it will be the worst fiscal inheritance that any party's had since the Second World War. And that's why we talk about a decade of national renewal. There will be some things we can do immediately and public services are obviously one of our priorities. Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A report found just 47% of local road miles were rated as being good, with 36% adequate and 17% poor. The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils are expected to fix 2 million potholes in the current financial year. That's up by 43% on the previous year and the highest annual total since 2015. Pothole campaigner Mark Morrill wants to see the government invest in road repairs. I don't accept there's no money. They find money 
for things that they want to spend on that, you know, me and you disagree on HS2. I mean, £66 billion, pounds, the real road check that won't go in central London, never, to up to Birmingham, when our roads networks are failing. To me, it's like putting an extension on our Scots subsidence. But there's loads of examples where government can find money where it wants to, but it's not a priority for them. Um, you know, on the other side, every time you have a repair on your vehicle, because they get 20% VAT, don't they? Childcare costs for under twos have had the highest annual increase in more than 20 years, whilst places have dropped. A part-time nursery place for a child under two now costs an average of £158 per week. According to the Coram Family and Childcare Charity, costs have risen by 7% from 2023, with the most expensive area being Inner London, with the average cost of £218 per week. Meanwhile, only a third of English council areas have sufficient childcare for full-time parents. Unilever is set to slash 7,500 jobs worldwide under its new cost-cutting overhaul. The Marmite and Dove soap owner, which employs 6,000 staff in the UK, is cutting jobs in a hopes to save around £684 million over the next three years. The consumer goods giant also said it would split off its ice cream business, which includes Wool's, Ben & Jerry's and Magnum brands, by 2025. And the Princess of Wales has been filmed smiling and looking happy while out shopping with Prince William. It comes after the couple have faced weeks of social media speculation around Catherine's health and whereabouts. Now, the Sun newspaper has published the pictures and a video of Prince William and Princess Catherine strolling through a car park on Saturday at a Windsor farm shop. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, it's back to Andrew and Bev. Ten oh seven. You're with Brian's newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Well, he's finally going, Mark Drakeford. If you live in Wales, you probably can't wait for this. He's officially stepping down as first minister after five years this afternoon. Uh, his successor, Vaughan Gethin, will take over tomorrow, making history as the first black leader of a nation in Europe. And he leaves after a pretty torrid time, I would say. Twenty mile an hour speed limit in Wales. Hated. Yeah. Education standards in Wales falling. Lots of people in Wales coming into England for the NHS. And this story today, schools are allowing children to change gender mm -hmm. without telling parents in Wales. Yeah. That's Labour. I hope that's not going to be what's coming to the rest of the country when we get a Keir Starmer government, which is coming. Their NHS is in a mess. There's yeah. all sorts. Their, their lockdowns were brutal and cruel, even worse than here. Well, joining us now from Cardiff is our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. Um, obviously, we've given him such a lovely introduction there, uh, Catherine. What might people say in defence of Mark Drapeford on his uh, last day in the office? Yes, good morning, Andrew and Bev. Well, for a long time, Mark Drakeford, of course, he was first minister here for five years. That comes to an end today. Things were pretty stable, pretty calm. You didn't hear very much in the way of dissent. He was, in fact, very, very popular here in Wales and for a long time and right through COVID where, as you rightly said, uh, Wales had much stricter restrictions um, than the rest of the United Kingdom. But the people of Wales accepted that and seemed happy to go along with it. In the last, it's only really the 20 miles per hour um, debacle, if you like. I mean, there's, there's arguments for it and against, but Drakeford admits that perhaps they could have handled it better, that his popularity has really started to slide. And of course, there's the issue of the farmers being potentially told to give over portions of their land to, to trees and to sort of rewilding. That's very controversial as well. Also, not a great record on the NHS. But Vaughan Gething that is coming in tomorrow as first minister he will be the first black leader of any country in europe so that's a big big moment but um i'm joined now by andrew rt davis he is the leader of the opposition here in the senate um thank you so much for talking to us today on gb news um first of all 
What do you make of Drakeford's legacy and what do you want to see going forward? Well, I think you break it up into two parts. One, there's the COVID part, which, as you just in introduced the article, these pieces to the camera, was saying that the Welsh people did get behind him in the measures he took. Now, it's debatable how effective those measures were because, obviously, more people died in Wales than any other part of the United Kingdom. But it is a fact that he did gain widespread public support from them. On the second side of the coin, though, there is these crazy policies that have come out recently, such as the 20 MPH across the whole of Wales, also 36 more politicians in the building behind me, whilst NHS waiting times are spiralling out of control, the economy isn't in a good state here in Wales, and education performance has declined, if you rank it on international rankings that PISA rankings showed just before Christmas. So on the policy position, it's a very poor legacy, but on a public service, there's a big tick in the box because the Welsh people did vote for him in 2021. On the 20 miles per hour specifically, it seems that people, when it's in their own road that they live in, are quite happy. It was more of a problem that um, roads into town centres and whatever where people weren't living, that it was going to be, in, well, actually introduced in September, but uh, being enforced as of yesterday. Um, what are you calling on? Because um, Vaughan Gething has indicated that they will look at tweaking it potentially. Well, no one disagrees that outside sensitive sites such as schools, hospitals, care homes, etc., the 20 MPH is a sensible traffic calming measure. But the, but the national speed limit that they brought in across the whole of Wales really did test public patience with this policy. And we've just seen come through the doors of this Senate building over half a million, nearly half a million signatures on a petition, the biggest petition the Senate has ever seen to revoke these measures. And as you said, the incoming First Minister has highlighted that he will have a review of it. I'm sceptical how effective that review will be. We just need to get rid of 20 MPH and go back to the sensible policy area which says that outside sensitive sites, yes, 20 is plenty, but when it comes to the wider network that was historically 30 MPH, we need to restore that 30 miles per hour back onto Welsh roads. 20 miles an hour limits, though, are nothing uh, exclusive to Wales. There's a lot of them in uh, urban areas in England as well, aren't there? There are, but that's the localised net nature of the policy in England, where, sure, we had last September the national rollout across all roads that were 30 mph down to 20 mph, and 97% of that road network was reduced to 20 miles per hour. That will have a devastating impact on the economy, even by the Welsh Government's own figures of £9 billion a cost to the Welsh economy, which is something the Welsh economy can ill afford. And it's debatable when you look at other areas in Europe and across the United Kingdom whether it will have the desired outcomes in saving fatalities and injuries which we all want to see. So it's not saying that 20 is bad. Outside sensitive sites, such as schools, hospitals, care homes, it's a sensible policy. But the national rollout of this policy was a bad policy move by the, by the First Minister and his government, and the people have responded accordingly. And what do you make of the story in The Telegraph today that children are being allowed to basically choose their gender ID in schools, effectively transition, um, and their parents knowing absolutely nothing about it? Do you think that can be right? It's completely wrong. I'm a parent of four children myself, and up to the age of 18, you are legally responsible for your child's well-being and welfare, and it's vital that the parent stays at the centre of the decision-making along with the child to make sure that the welfare of the children are protected here in Wales. It's a crazy, crazy policy area, and I would hope that the incoming First Minister will take a radical look at it and put the safeguards in place that should be required. And finally, um, election in the Senate here in 2026, but a general election coming later this year, um, Conservative MPs fighting very publicly amongst themselves, thinking about getting rid of Rishi Sunak. What would your message be to them, um, your forecast potentially, Conservatives to lose all the seats in Wales? for them to shut up, get behind the Prime Minister, start doing the job they're paid to do, which is representing their constituents, and mapping out a positive vision for what the Conservatives will offer at that general election. Because it's only the Conservatives on the side of hard-working people, whether it's in Wales, England, Scotland or Northern Ireland. And when you look at what Keir Starmer said, that Wales would be the blueprint for his UK government, only look at one in four people on a waiting list in Wales, education standards in free fall, and the economy sadly not performing and take home wages £3,000 less than the parts of the United Kingdom. That's the blueprint Keir Starmer's working to. So pull your fingers out, Conservative MPs, get behind the Prime Minister and let's win the next general election. Andrew R.T. Davis, thank you very much for talking to us today. So a very clear message to Conservative MPs in Westminster, pull your fingers out and get behind the press Prime Minister. Of course, um, it's uh, debatable whether Conservative MPs in uh, Westminster are listening. Back to you.
Thank Catherine you, Catherine. Um, and of course, we shouldn't forget, we did ask Labour Assembly members yes. to come on. We invited every single one of them. They all declined, but no surprise, because, of course, one of his last acts, Drakeford, was to ban GP News being <laughs> inputted into the Senate at a cost of £250,000 to the Welsh taxpayer. Do we look like we would be mean and unkind to you? We wouldn't. We'd be nice. We'd talk to you. We like to talk to everybody. Still come on. Still plenty oh, of time. Maybe we can get the new guy on, Vaughan Gethin. Let's see if we can get him to come on. This is your official invitation, Vaughan. And, we'd love you to come on now. And, and he's, he's a pioneer. He is the first black yeah. head of state. Born in Zambia. Not born head of state, leader of a country in Europe. That's right. Um, so, let, your, let us know your thoughts this morning. We are going to look through your emails in just a moment. GBFews at GBNews.com. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Don't go anywhere. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight. Every night from 11pm. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her uh, touching her zip because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's... she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And, and also, and also <laughs> this isn't a far right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly. Yeah. I mean, well, she's, she's, just, up, we, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah, so she's, not far right. But also, I mean, even if she were right wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an? One of the most important issues of our day. What well, did Labour play out here? They're anti democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack a mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say, I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you. Well, if you no, say they won't. Because they? They you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and, of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Very good morning, Nigel Nelson. Wind your neck in. Just be quiet, just for a moment. But we're also joined by medical writer and uh, broadcaster Dr Renee Hundekamp in the studio. Morning, Nigel. Good morning. Um, <laughs> right, <laughs> shall we go first to this story? Yeah. This is a story about double standards between various broadcast channels. This is a BBC interview with a journalist apparently in Islamabad. Have a look at the footage behind her on the motorway behind the bridge. Here we go. Very high, Anita, and in course, in fact, in course, the last few minutes, we've just had confirmation from the, uh, the foreign ministry here in Pakistan confirming that Pakistan did carry out attacks inside uh, Afghanistan, inside Afghanistan territory. Uh, the statement has come saying that this morning Pakistan carried out intelligence-based anti-terrorist operations. 
side. So, if you could see then, yeah. that is on a loop. That is footage that's recorded, Renee, and the bus comes out and then it jumps yeah. and then the bus comes out. How are they able to get away with saying she might be in Islamabad, but she's not stood on a bridge over the motorway? Well, it is just, you know, one rule for you guys and one for us. And we're quite happy to tell the world that we are the arbiters of what is truth. We've got our BBC Verify. You can trust us. So please just look away. Don't see this because it's not real. And it's just obscene yeah. that they are allowed to paint this picture, that they are the place to go for really trustworthy information. This says live. It's clearly not live. It's no. clearly a lie. And I think we need to start being able to call the BBC out. Why are Ofcom not in charge of what the BBC did? Yeah. Yeah, because if that had been GB News, Nigel, they wouldn't have thrown the book at us, oh. they would have thrown the entire library at us. <laughs> yes, and that's probably right. Uh, and no, this can't be justified. I mean, the whole thing is that uh, they're presenting something which is basically not true. Yeah. Um, so there was no reason why that interview could not be done in a studio with that kind of backdrop of Islamabad. Sure. We, as far as we know that she's in Islamabad. Um, what you can't do is, again, we're back to that thing about manipulating yeah. images. So. Um, um, uh, poor old Kate Middleton gets into the neck for doing something like yeah. that. And it's quite right in the present climate with AI, you, you don't know what is actually genuine anymore and what isn't. Mm. It is essential that then news organisations put their stuff out as genuine. And the BBC is seen by still so many people as gospel. Yeah, and also, bear in mind that the... And publicly uh, funded. Yeah, and, but, and also, really importantly, the BBC has a huge audience abroad. Yes. And so what we want is, if we have a national broadcaster such as the BBC, which is going all over the world, it's got to be truthful. Um, do you still have faith in the BBC that you might have had four or five years ago? I think four or five years ago <laughs> is an interesting point, because I lost it quite swiftly during the COVID epidemic, obviously, even when they put me up on there and used people to absolutely absolutely spout nonsense at me to make me look like a lunatic. Mm. So, no, I lost it then. Yeah. I mean, let's not forget, Bev, they have a video online today by another GP that they ran very early in COVID that said the um, AstraZeneca vaccine is 100% effective at protecting you from catching the virus. That video is still online today as we speak. And that is materially wrong. And it was wrong then when she said it. Yeah. We knew that. It, it's, and I, I, I obviously share that opinion that I've lost faith in the BBC. I'm quite sad, Nigel, about the fact that I've lost faith in the BBC. I used to be one of those people who loved the BBC. Yeah, well, I haven't lost faith in it. Um, I still <laughs> I still think it delivers um, uh, reasonable, impartial news, so I'm quite happy with that. Do you this, think it's impartial? Impartial? Yes, yeah. oh, yeah, it is. The, e even to the point where the, 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 um, the balance of the BBC um, goes too far. So what tends to happen is they want to make things so balanced that minority voices get a disproportionate amount of airtime and so slightly skew the debate. But that's not balance, is it? It. That isn't balance. And I would say the great example for me was when Newsnight did a debate about GB News. Yes, and yeah. there was nobody on there representing this channel. That's not balance. Yeah. No, there wasn't. And then the whole thing was that they accepted that was a mistake. Um, I think on this Islamabad um, video, they should accept that is a mistake. I don't think that it that we, we then say the BBC is rubbish because no, they make a couple but, of no. mistakes. But, but, why, but why haven't they come out and said, in hindsight, that was a mistake because they've manipulated the news. They are manipulating p people who are watching it and listening. Well, I don't know why they haven't come out, uh, come out and said that. Because it's but obvious. They, but what they're listening on the radio. Do you think they're waiting it's so obvious verify. that this has been what, manipulated? What they should do is, is actually say so now. <laughs> right. Um, well, let's talk about something that the BBC do not have, which is an exclusive interview with Donald Trump. Yes. That belongs only to GB News, thanks to Nigel Farage. Renee, are you looking forward to watching this interview? What could it tell us that we don't already know about Donald Trump? I think that this is absolutely amazing, and I absolutely agree with you that no other channel is going to get this interview because they don't have the access that Farage ha has. And also, Trump knows that if he were to go on the BBC, it would be cut, edited and spliced with questions aimed in such a way to make him look like a far-right lunatic. And I think it's time that we had places where people who had views right of centre, mm. that's lots of us, by the way, um, could actually express those in a reasonable way. I'm hoping that what we see is him expressing it in a reasonable way. But I think it's fantastic. And we do need to be able to hear every single voice, mm. whether it's far left, far right, mm. somewhere in the middle, we need to be able to hear them. Now, yeah. so how important is it that we find out from Trump what his position is on Ukraine? Because people might think, oh, Ukraine, here we go again. But if America pulls the plug on Ukraine, how long does Britain carry on?
we're committed to £12 billion. Yes, we are. Um, and I think that things like that are essential. He's, he's, we're not quite sure his, his behaviour on Ukraine. And there's these nasty sort of rumours coming out that Putin's quite keen for him to be the next president <laughs> because of that, that he might actually not support Ukraine in the way America has done in the past. Equally, we need to know his position on NATO. Yeah, very important. They're all, they're all linked there. Now, um, it, it, when he was president last time round, he did make the not unreasonable point that America shouldn't be stumping up all the money. He's right about that. Yeah, and the other and other countries should actually pay their fair share. You can't just rely on America as the shield for mm. Europe. But again, we need to know what does he think fair share is, which countries are actually uh, doing it. Um, we are heading towards our 2.5%. We're not quite sure when we'll get there yet. Um, what he wants from other countries. But I think that those kind of things are the really important parts of the interview because we'll know what kind of president he will be. Will you be watching it? Oh, you bet. Yeah. 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 I mean, <laughs> you, I, I wouldn't miss Trump. But, but you, do you think he is a deranged right-wing lunatic? Yes. I thought you did. Yeah. Just so, don't uh, talk about Nigel Farage like that. Interest of balance. I don't. No. <laughs> so if it was in America, if you were a vote in the American election, Renee, would you be voting for Biden or Trump? A hundred percent. We need some. We need somebody who's proud of their country, who is prepared to stand up and say the things that we don't want to hear quite often. So when I heard him last week say America is the laughing stock of the world, I actually thought as I heard it, do you know we need someone strong enough and comfortable enough in their own convictions to stand up and say that in the UK? Are we concerned about his language? There is still this ongoing round. What did he mean when he talked about if I don't win, there'll be bloodshed? But now, I watched that say, interview. Now, is it fair to say he was talking about if he doesn't win, there'll be bloodshed in the in the car, car industry? A hundred percent. I watched it. I watched the entire right. interview. Again, it was cut by the press who want to paint him as a yeah. far right lunatic to suggest he was again suggesting an uprising. He wasn't. He said he was going to protect the car industry. He was going to put a hundred percent tariffs on cars from Mexico. But if Biden won, there would be a bloodbath. Yeah. Anybody who wants to read that as any. And I that's fair, isn't it? Industry. What really yeah, well, said? Yeah, it, it, because it has been the reported. The trouble about Trump is his unfortunate use of words. So um, somebody else would not have used words like that. Don't use the word bloodbath. I mean, that that if you, if you don't but mean he that. He talks to the people who vote for him who don't yeah. always necessarily. Yeah. They aren't the sesquipedalians. And, well, no, I mean, yeah. and if you're like a car Johnson. worker, if you're a car worker, you'll welcome what he said. It, it's what they said last time that, that, that Trump's opponents take him literally but not seriously, and his, his supporters take him seriously but not literally. You see, I can distinguish between the character of the man, who I think has some flaws, let's be honest, and particularly as a woman, some of the things I've said <laughs> he said make my sort of skin bristle a little. However, I can distinguish between him being that man and his view of the world, his ideology, his frank, forthright um, political take... I'm on board with that. Yeah. And I think we should be able to have both those opinions. Yeah, I'm on board with that. And as a woman, I feel exactly the same yeah. about some of this stuff. But I think everybody who lives a normal life, who isn't finding that they've got any money left over at the end of the month, is looking at Trump thinking, you know what this man thinks about me? Yeah. He wants there to be food on my table. He wants me to enjoy my life. And I think we're seeing that across Europe. And I think we will see that yeah. across Europe and, this and year. And, you know, um, Nigel, I was talking to somebody who's plugged into the Democrats the other day who said Biden can only do five hours a day. He's then he can be fluent and coherent and articulate. <laughs> five hours a day. Look, you can't be president of the United States for five hours a day. It's a 24-7 job. And wow. in an election campaign, it's 18-hour days. Yeah, I'm not, This I, is really worrying. I, I do think that, that, that uh, American voters have not got much of a choice at the moment. They have Trump on one side and Biden on the other. It's a pity that that is actually the only candidate I, out there. I still believe that come June or July... Biden will step well, aside for yeah. health re reasons. He'll say that he got more electoral votes than anyone, so he can go out with his head held high, mm. but step aside for whoever they parish. Michelle him. Obama? Possibly. She she well, we saw, well we saw... I know. Yeah, but she's, she's not really... She said that and historically, that, didn't she? No, we had Barack Obama here yesterday. She, she came up recently. Oh, did yeah. she? Did, just a few weeks ago. We did see her husband the other day, yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. Looking yeah. pretty distinguished. Didn't he just? Yeah. Just yeah. I think one of the headlines was. Not that, that he did anything when he was in the White a popular House. popular leader Nigel. in Downing Street. Yeah, but, but what did he achieve when he was in the White House? Not much. <laughs> oh, I, I think that's, that's, un, that's unfair. Lots of um, war. I do yeah, lots of war. Guantanamo Bay still mm -hmm. getting strong. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that, that he did. And, and just to be um, fair to Trump, he oh. didn't do the horrible things that we thought he might. Mm. I mean, in fairness to Trump, there were no foreign wars. No. Um, so he kept that kind of promise. Um, it, I don't know whether the system actually mitigates against a president going... Uh, just, just getting it completely wrong. And so the system kind of takes over and makes sure... But the system the should mitigate a president who can only do the job for five hours a day. Well, I mean, I, d I hadn't heard that, uh, heard that. Um, but yes, there's a problem there. I mean, it's quite clear that um, uh, th that Biden has a, has trouble with his mental faculties. That is a worry. Which will for get the, worse for the leader of the free world. We have a doctor here; they can only get worse. Yeah, I actually part of me thinks it's really sad to watch. I think we yeah. are watching somebody's mental health unravel slowly, yeah. and it isn't kind and it isn't fair. So I actually think him stepping aside will be the best thing. I don't think it's the best thing for Trump to win, but it will be the best thing. Mm. Who, who would take over though? Well, well, I think uh, Michelle is up there, whether she says she won't do it or yeah. not. Then there are a few other senators. I don't think Gavin Newsom is in the running now because no. people are moving out of California. He's just messed it up so badly. But there are some younger... Kamala you know, Harris is... Oh, no. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Desperate, but I mean, she'd be the That's first... That's the most likely she'd be the first yeah. in the ranks, The vice president. She? Yeah. They would, she would step up. She would step up. And she's so, apparently hopeless as well. Well, I mean, I don't, we don't know that. We, we never see her. Right, Renee and Nigel, that's it for now. You will be back in the next hour. Um, double O Who. Oh, love this. Have the, you heard of him? The new Taylor James Johnson. Bond. <laughs> Have you heard of him? No, I'd never heard of him. I'd heard of his wife. She used to be Sam Taylor Wood, of course, TV uh, movie director and photographer. She became Sam Taylor Johnson. She married him. She's 24 years older than him. Well done. Um, we're going to be talking about the fact that he is very likely to be the new James Bond. All that and more after your morning's news with Sophia Wensley. Thanks, Bev. Good morning. It's 10.32. I'm Sophia Wensley in the GB newsroom. Your headlines. The Prime Minister faces a fresh battle with the House of Lords over his Rwanda bill after a victory in the Commons overnight. MPs rejected all ten amendments, one of which was designed to ensure the bill complies with domestic and international law. The controversial legislation aims to deter illegal immigrants from coming to the UK on small boats by deporting them to Rwanda. Downing Street says the initial cohort of people is now being contacted and the Prime Minister is determined to get flights off the ground in the spring. Labour will seek to bring about a new chapter in Britain's economic history. The Shadow Chancellor will promise in a speech this evening. Rachel Reeves plans to reform the Treasury if Labour wins government as part of her economic policy. Addressing finance leaders at the annual May lecture in the City of London, she will liken the economic challenge awaiting the next government to that faced by Margaret Thatcher. Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils were expected to fix two million potholes in the current financial year. That's up 43% on the previous year and the highest annual total since 2015. And the Princess of Wales has been filmed smiling and looking happy while out shopping with Prince William. It comes after the couple have faced weeks of social media speculation surrounding Catherine's health and whereabouts. Now the Sun newspaper has published the pictures and a video of Prince William and Princess Catherine strolling through a car park on Saturday at Windsor Farm Shop. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2673 and €1.1691. The price of gold is £1,700.96 and pence per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,720 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Still to come, we are bang in the middle of a dentistry crisis in this country. It only seems to be getting worse. A top dentist will join us next to give his thoughts on the government's dental recovery plan and why it won't work. You yes. don't have any problems with that, do you? I don't. I, I go and see my dentist. Every day? No, hygiene. <laughs> hygiene is three times a year. Very important. Very, Don't go anywhere. Very important. Very important. Bye-bye. <laughs>
GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Absenteeism. And parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. Mm. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine, like that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm. I'm mm. going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently were, uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Yeah. So how could, you know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months. But if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now. Absolutely. Because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know taking great measures Well, to I think that. one of their plans is to have a national register, hmm. which, 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 would, which would help with that. Which would definitely help. But I think it, it's, it's almost... It's, you can't, well, they can't deal with the real problem, so they're going after it's... actually perfectly you know, decent parents who are just taking the odd day off you know, for, to save money, frankly. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. 10.37, you'll be getting in touch at yep. home about Mark Drakesford's last day at the yes. Senate. Yes, and they're not keen on born guessing. No. The new man, Martin, says he says Mark Drake, Drakeford in a different life, responsible for the massive decline of the Welsh NHS. And Elaine says Wales has had enough. Drakeford, thank God, has gone, but now we're left with yes. guessing that we, the voters, didn't want. Jennifer says Andrew said good to seeing the back of Drakeford. Yes, but the people of Wales are using their savings and going into debt to pay for medical operations thanks to Vaughan Gethin and his mismanagement of the health service. We are doomed here. Because he, he was the health minister and the health service is in a terrible mess in the N NHS in Wales. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and where else are your messages? Here we go, potholes. We're going to be oh, talking yeah. about these in just a moment because you are as, as incensed as we are about the condition of our roads at the moment. And Martin says, what's the point in having an MOT on your car to make sure it's safe if the roads aren't safe? Due Ma to potholes. Imagine if you're on a bike. Now, cyclists drive me nuts because they're always going through red lights and up one-way streets, but, my word, they're dangerous for Really those dangerous. Really dangerous. And Gary says, come to Halifax in New Yorkshire, there are almost more potholes <laughs> than roads. <laughs> um, there seems to be more potholes than cars sometimes down in London. And Edwina says, I have a lot of sympathy with the councils with the weather we've had this winter, which has made a significant effect on the potholes and the roads. But if you remember, when the government suspended the northern part of HS2, it said some of the billions of savings from that would be spent on emergency repairs to potholes. Where are they, then? The thing is, Edwina, there are other countries which have more extreme weather than us, and they do yes. seem to be able to tackle their potholes. But I like your advice. She says, if I ring my council about one that appears on a dangerous bend near me, it's usually repaired in a few days. You need to let them know. I like that kind of public service announcement, Edwina. I shall be doing that. Yeah, well, as long as they repair them better than the potholes where I live in North London, because they're always fixing the same pothole, and three months later, they're back. 
Well, because they don't fix it properly. So true. Because they paper it over. Well, talking of holes that need fixing, just three percent of dentists believe that the government's dental recovery plan will result in them seeing more patients. Just tell you that again. 3% of dentists believe in these new plans. 43% uh, of dentists believe the proposals will lead to them seeing fewer patients. This is all part of the government's 200 million plan to bolster NHS dentistry last month. Well, the chief executive of the Oral Health Foundation is Dr Nigel Carter. Dr Carter, just remind us, how have we got to this situation that so few people now can get to see an NHS dentist? It's really a perfect storm and it's a multitude of things that have actually caused us to get in this position. We had a new NHS dental contract back in 2006. That was very widely uh, criticised, including by a health select committee report. Um, so it wasn't liked by patients, it wasn't liked by dentists. And we then um moved into a phase where we were piloting a new contract which would have been much more based on uh delivery of better outcomes for the patient so better health outcomes um instead of which it, the discussion has got highlighted into hijacked into the fact that there would have to be um outcome measures output measures as well so really counting how many fillings dentists were doing um, which is an old-fashioned model based on the high level of, of disease that existed when the health service first arose. Um, so that was moved towards a new contract, was summarily pulled at the end of uh, 2022, and we've had no real progress since. And that's led to um, dentists beginning to drift away from the mm. health service mm. and to the so-called dental deserts. I mean, there are areas, particularly rural areas, East Anglia, Suffolk, Dorset, where there are just no NHS dentists uh, at all. It's some of the plan actually sounds really good, Nigel. In in practice, in in theory, um, that some dentists would be driven around in vans to treat people living in remote areas who may not necessarily be able to get to a, a surgery, uh, to offer twenty thousand pounds per dentist to work in those areas which are underserved, a financial incentive, and to be paid more for NHS work. What else should they do, or what could an incoming Labour government perhaps? What could they do? I think it's very difficult for a government of either complexion, to be honest, because the other point that we've got in there is a severe manpower shortage. And that's been exacerbated greatly by Brexit. We had a lot of EU dentists working in the UK who have gradually drifted away and gone back home. And it's much um, less easy for them now to come uh, into the UK. So we've got a workforce shortage. Uh, both with dentists and with uh, uh, with dental nurses mm. and with hygienists and therapists as well. Um, so there's proposals in the NHS recovery plan for and the work NHS workforce plan to train new dentists but they're not going to be starting that until 2027, which yes. means they're not going to be online and trained until into the 2030s. Yeah. So there's a but real now, issue. Nigel, isn't the real problem, of course, it's the old problem that they're having in the NA with, with doctors. People, den dentists can earn a lot more in the private sector and, it's probably, and they probably, forgive me if I'm saying it, they perhaps don't have to do quite as many patients. Well, that, that's the other problem. I think you hit on uh, mm. something that because if a dentist moves into private practice, they're probably spending more time on their patients. NHS dentistry is very much a, a production line. Um, and as a result, they're seeing more patients, less patients, which makes uh, the situation even worse. They're not making huge amounts of money out of the NHS. It's just that over the last decade or more, um, NHS dentistry has been treated as one of the public sector areas that was subject to um, very small mm. pay rises. And it's just become, dentists are their own self-employed businessmen. They have to pay for all their own equipment, their premises, their staff. Yeah. And it's become simply impossible for them to do that under the NHS in many cases. Nigel, the biggest cause of hospitalisation of children mm. in this country is teeth extraction. How do we get back to a place where parents are 
forcing their kids to clean their teeth, because you do have to force your kids, it's the kind of thing they don't want to do, where parents are taking more responsibility for their children's dental hygiene as well? That's absolutely the case. I mean, we have to realise here that we're talking about oral diseases which are almost entirely preventable. And it is down to that home uh, regime. It's down to how well you clean your teeth. Um, you know, well known and people recognise that dentists recommend that they clean their teeth for two minutes twice a day. Um, as a nation, we clean our teeth for about 43 seconds. Um, mm. We say rec we would recommend changing a toothbrush every three months. As a nation, we buy 1.13 toothbrushes a year. So there's mm. there's a huge amount of work to be done there to really get the population looking after their mm. teeth uh, mm. and improving their health outcomes and reducing the strain on the uh, health service at the same time. But at the moment, it's very difficult to see where we're going with an instant solution. And yes, there is a little bit of money with this NHS recovery plan, but yeah. The 200 million is very small when you look at the total size of the NHS budget. Yeah. OK, thanks so much, Chief Executive of the Oral Health Foundation, Dr Nigel Carter. I have to say, I was very cynical about Labour's plan to have teachers help kids clean their teeth, but you realise the scale yeah. of the problem. Maybe it's the only way. But it was drummed into us as kids at school. Yes. I brush my teeth at least three times a day. I do as I've well. I've got a toothbrush in the office, uh, and so I, when I and after I have my lunch in the mm. office, I brush my teeth. But you know what? And it's one of those. It is one of those parenting things. You have to have zero yeah. tolerance on them arguing with you, and it's such a battle. But you get them into the habit very, very young, and they will stay with. And them. you could, when your toothbrush was battered, you used to get a new one. Yeah. And it was always, we always had a, at least one toothbrush in the Christmas stocking. It's one of those things that just has massively slipped off the parenting yeah. kind of list of responsibilities. Apple a day. And I don't quite know it was why. Was good for your teeth. Now they just eat. Tons of sweets, I which do. is also a massive problem. OK, in just a moment, we're going to be discussing the new favourite to be James Bond. It's an actor named Aaron Taylor Johnson, which me, you never heard of him. No, you with I haven't. <laughs> You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Bit of rain around this morning first thing, but most of us will have a, a kind of brightening up sort of day with some bright or sunny spells later and not too much rain by this afternoon. Even this morning, the rain is fairly well scattered, but some pretty heavy showers across northern Scotland with a gusty wind and a smattering of showers over parts of England and Wales, particularly the Midlands, North East England. We'll see a few more of those through the afternoon, but I'm hopeful for something a bit brighter for uh, Wales, Western Scotland, and even further south, there'll be some bright spells, which could see temperatures get to 16, 17, maybe 18 Celsius. So that's pretty mild for the time of year. Feeling colder with a stiff wind over the far north of Scotland. That'll ease a little as we go through the nights and then more rain comes into Wales and southwest England. So things turning damp here through the evening. That rain will spread into the Midlands and Northern Ireland as we go through the night and eventually into southern Scotland. With all the cloud and the outbreaks of mostly light rain, won't be a cold night. Temperatures in the south staying in double figures in some towns and cities. A dull, dank, drizzly start then for Wednesday morning, certainly over the Midlands, North Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern Scotland. Most of the south, again, largely dry and much of northern Scotland having a fine day on Wednesday. Some decent spells of sunshine for the highlands, brightening up too across northern Ireland. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease, but many places will stay fairly cloudy tomorrow. A cooler day as a result, but still pretty mild in the southeast. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out.
with my panel here on Jubes and Co. We debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Ten fifty. Welcome back to Britain's newsroom. Andrew, did you hear that? I what did. was that noise? What noise? Oh. It's your theme tune. It's... Did you ask them to play that? I did. It is the iconic theme music of James Bond. Been going since 1961 with Dr No. <laughs> the Sun says they've written it pretty hard. Got a new 007. He is called Aaron Taylor Johnson. Yes. Who's he? <laughs> well, apparently he's been offered this job as the next uh, fictional but world's most famous spy. Uh, we hadn't heard of him. He's appeared in uh, Marvel films, apparently. And he is also married to a very famous um, movie director and photographer. She was Sam Taylor Wood. She married him. She became Sam Taylor Johnson. So 23 that's... years age gap. So yeah. let's talk to the chairman of the International James Bond Club, David Black. David, have you heard of him? I'm afraid I'm like you two, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I have heard of him only because of the rumours going around. Um, I've seen him in a... Uh, I saw him in one film, The Bullet... I think it was it called Bullet Train, I think the one with Brad Pitt. Oh, and, I saw uh, that film. He was, yeah. he was in that, was he? Right. He was, yeah. Um, I, I think he looks all right. What's the reaction <laughs> been like with the James Bond fan club to this news? Surprise a little, maybe? I'll tell you what, every time there's going to be a new James Bond, the rumours come out, we're here again and again, so-and-so will do it, someone else will do it, and then it turns, to be, turns out to be somebody different. So I usually take it with a pinch of salt. As you, as you say, the reports are coming out sound fairly firm, so... Mm, yeah. This could be it. Um, generally, let, let, just going back, really, I think Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson, they've been putting these things together for a long, long time. I mean, the Bond franchise has been going, what, I don't know, 60, 62 years. Yeah. And they usually seem to come up with a winning formula. So I do sort of trust their judgment. It's also interesting, isn't it, David, that actually it's not a woman. There'd been speculation we'd get our first female James Bond, and he's not a black James Bond. There'd been talk it could be Idris Elba. He's, a, he's just an ordinary white bloke um, who, if you look at him in this photograph, if you've listened on the radio, talk to Daniel Craig about him. He's very handsome. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, David, are you re re reassured, or did it not matter to you whether the actor was female, male or black? Well, firstly, Barbara Broccoli was quoted as saying that uh, it wouldn't be a woman, I'm afraid, not on her watch. Now, that's not... People say to me, ah, but 007 was a woman in the last film. That's correct, but that's not James Bond. And I think if you're going to stick to the, the writings of Ian Fleming, he created the character. You've got to have some sense of... Yeah. You've got, mm. to keep some, you've got to keep in line with what he was writing. You can't just go changing it. I, I don't know. It's a very tricky question. A lot of people ask, mm. what if it was this type of actor or that type of actor? All, to me, I like it to try and bear you know, some resemblance to the character he created. That's all I would say. He's a, uh, and he's I think a, this will work. He's a Buckinghamshire boy, David. He's from High Wycombe. Um, and, of course, they've all been English actors, hasn't there? I kept waiting for the day that there would be an American one face, faking well, a, a well, British Well, actually, Lazenby, accent. George Lazenby only did one. He was born in Australia, I think, wasn't oh. he? Yeah, so we've had an Australian and uh, we've had a Welshman. We had Timothy Dalton, he was Welsh. And we've had the Scotsman. Right. He was uh, he, he was Sean, obviously. So we've, we've had a favorite? bit of a... Who was your favourite? My favourite's always uh, Sean Connery, I'm afraid. Back to the original. Although I, I like them all in their own way. So I'm, uh, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I, like, I think they're all great. I, I like Roger Moore because he played it for laughs. And, but I thought mm. Piers Brosnan was so impossibly glamorous. Mm. 
Yes, and I think people, whoever you grew up with, I think has some bearing on it. You know, I certainly, and certainly the Roger Moore films were sort of my time, and I've sort of got a bit of fond, you know, I just remember, remember them with a fondness. It, they're a bit humorous, but let's remember, it's a film, isn't it? It's meant to be entertainment. People say, oh, is it, is it relevant in today's okay. society? Well, who cares? <laughs> uh, so right, thank right. you, David. We've, yeah. we've, we've run out of time. David Black there, Chairman of the International James Bond Fan Club. I had no idea you had such strong opinions on James Bond. I've interviewed two of them. Have you? Mm. Right, up next, we're going to be hearing a snippet of the exclusive interview with Donald Trump. Don't go anywhere. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Here's your weather with Aidan McGiven. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, welcome to the GB News forecast. Overnight, we're going to see a lot of cloud today and further showers, but actually there will still be some drier and brighter interludes out there. We've got weather fronts clearing into the North Sea, another set of fronts lining up for overnight. But in between, for the afternoon, we've got a legacy of cloud cover, especially across the south and southeast. Some brighter spells emerging, but also quite a number of showers. The showers scattered, but I think they'll be focused across southwest England into parts of the Midlands as well as northern parts of East Anglia into Lincolnshire. Away from the showers, where we do get some sunshine coming through, feeling warm once again in the southeast, 17 Celsius, much cooler further north, 9 or 10 for Scotland. Although in Scotland, plenty of sunny spells. We'll keep the clear spells and the uh, mostly dry weather in the north of Scotland overnight. Likewise, for the far southeast, it stays largely dry, but elsewhere, Cloud increasing, outbreaks of rain turning up. Of course, the cloud and the rain keeps the temperatures from falling away. So 9 or 10 Celsius for many of us as we start off Wednesday. Although the far northwest of Scotland will see a touch of frost where the skies are clearest. And that's where the brightest weather will be on Wednesday, western and northwest Scotland. And then after a damp start, Northern Ireland as well. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover and outbreaks of rain continuing through parts of northern and central England, Wales and the southwest. Feeling warm though in the southeast. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out.
with my panel here on Jubes & Co. We debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 11 a.m. on Tuesday, the 19th of March. This is Britain's News on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Hey, good morning. Thank you for joining us. So, photos and videos of the Princess of Wales out and about over the weekend are on the front pages of the paper. There are still some people who don't believe it's her. Big moment to Nigel Farage in Florida, where he's interviewed former President Donald Trump. You can see it tonight at 7 p.m. only on GB News, being edited now, but here is a sneak preview. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. OK, let's get out of here. i got to go back to work. <laughs> Join me tonight at 7 o'clock on GB News. The full interview with Donald J. Trump. And plight of potholes. Roads around the country, as you will know, are at breaking point. It's the worst they've been for eight years. Are they bad where you live? And do you let your council know when you see a pothole? And the First Minister of, of Wales, Mark Drakeford, is stepping down this afternoon after five years in the job. Are you sad to see him go? Most of the emails and texts we've heard from Wales are absolutely not. I've got friends who live in Wales who are literally thinking of moving across the border to England because of the political situation yeah. in Wales and how miserable life is. They'd only be able to drive their car at 20 miles an hour into Britain, yeah. of course, because that's one of his mad ideas. And some of the, sometimes, some streets, 20 miles an hour, particularly residential areas where you've got kids playing on bikes, yeah. I'm absolutely yeah, on board yeah. with it. But Wales has these long, sweeping, do. does. 50 mile an hour roads with no houses on either side, just fields and high, high hedges, and to put 20 miles an hour on those yeah. roads. And the NHS, Madness. of course, is in a terrible state, and the new First Minister, Mr Gethin was the health minister yeah. for the last few years. Let us know your reactions to that change of personnel this morning. GB views at gbnews.com, particularly if you live in Wales. That and a lot more this morning. First, though, the very latest news with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Bev. Good morning. It's two minutes past 11. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your top story... Former US President Donald Trump has hinted he could deport Prince Harry if he wins the election. In an exclusive interview with Nigel Farage, he said the Duke of Sussex won't get special privileges if he lied on his visa about drug use. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in America. Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you would you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Mm, you would. But I thought they were very disrespectful to the family, to mm. the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I thought the Queen was incredible. And you can see that full interview with the former U.S. President Donald Trump on Farage tonight from 7 p.m. Now, the Prime Minister faces a fresh battle with the House of Lords over his Rwanda bill after a victory in the Commons overnight. MPs rejected all ten amendments, one of which was designed to ensure the bill complies with domestic and international law. The controversial legislation aims to deter illegal immigrants from coming to the UK on small boats by deporting them to Rwanda. Downing Street says the initial cohort of people is now being contacted. Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser says the government is still determined to see the first plane departing later this spring.
Uh, we saw um, those, those uh, amendments all fail in the House of Commons last night with strong majorities. Uh, obviously, it will go back to the Lords, but you know, what we are doing as a government, as a Conservative government, is trying to ensure that we deter people from taking that journey. We want to see illegal immigration down. We want to see uh, people not making that crossing. And we do think that this bill uh, will be a significant deterrent for people uh, who would otherwise cross the Channel. Labour will seek to bring about a new chapter in Britain's economic history, the Shadow Chancellor will promise in a speech this evening. Rachel Reeves plans to reform the Treasury if Labour wins government as part of her economic policy. Addressing finance leaders at the annual May lecture in the City of London, she will liken the economic challenge awaiting the next government to that faced by Margaret Thatcher. The speech comes after Ms Reeves said Labour would not be able to turn things around straight away if voted in. Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Darren Jones, outlined Rachel Reeves' plan. We are on the cusp of an opportunity in this country, an opportunity for a decade of national renewal, where we can get growth back into our economy, make people better off, um, and start to turn the page on 14 years of failure from the Conservatives. If Labour is to win the election later this year, uh, it will be the worst fiscal inheritance that any party's had since the Second World War. And that's why we talk about a decade of national renewal. There will be some things we can do immediately, and public services are obviously one of our priorities. Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A report found just 47% of local roads were rated as good, with 36% adequate and 17% poor. The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils were expected to fix two million potholes in the current financial year. That's up 43% on the previous year and the highest annual total since 2015. Pothole campaigner Mark Morrill wants to see the government invest in road repairs. I don't accept there's no money. They find money for things that they want to spend on the, you know, me and you disagree on HS2. I mean, £66 billion, the real road check that won't go in central London, never, to up to Birmingham, when our roads networks are failing. To me, it's like putting an extension on our Scott subsidence. But there's loads of examples where government can find money where it wants to, but it's not a priority for them. Um, you know, on the other side, every time you have a repair on your vehicle, because they get 20% VAT, don't they? And the Princess of Wales has been filmed smiling and looking happy while out shopping with Prince William. It comes after the couple have faced weeks of social media speculation surrounding Catherine's health and whereabouts. Now, the Sun newspaper has published the pictures and a video of Prince William and Princess Catherine strolling through the car park on a Saturday at Windsor Farm Shop. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. What's the time? The time is 11.06. This is Britain's News on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Thank you for getting in touch at home. You've been very busy. You are incensed by potholes, as are we. Duncan says, if you guys think that potholes are dangerous for cars, imagine what it's like on a motorbike. Must be terrible. Awful. Peter says, this is a very good point. Really good. More heavy electric cars on the road, the more potholes we will have. And I thought electric cars were good for the environment, but apparently they are part of the problem with this huge backlog now because electric cars are so heavy. They are in a bit of a bit of a, a, a turning point, aren't we, in terms of our relationship with electric cars. Jane says, in Preston, someone has put up a sign saying the Lancashire Highways Department has been twinned with the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Gotta love British humour. You've got to, it's brilliant, That's isn't it? That's funny. Let's send, send a us photo a picture. Of that. Yeah, exactly. We do want that Send us a picture. photo of that sign, and, Jane. And, and Mick says, motorcycle, it makes the same point, motorcycle riders yeah. suffer the pothole nightmare too. You avoid one hole and hit another with the added, added hazard of gravel to slip on. About the dentists and about the fact that the government's dental plan has gone down with dentists like root canal treatment. Only 3% of dentists think it's going to make any difference. Duncan says, I went private just before COVID as I couldn't get the NHS treatment no. I wanted. I've had NHS dental care all my life. I have to say I would not go back to the NHS even if I could get an appointment tomorrow. Well, the treatment is worlds apart. My teeth have never looked better. I'm 55. And Duncan, good luck. If you wanted to go back to the NHS, you wouldn't be able to, almost certainly. It's so expensive, though. Dental care, yeah. private dental is extortionate. Bob says, it's not just the dentist. I can't see my GP at all. And once we're in the surgery, the reception tells us to go to a nearest hub.
There's certainly a lot of fixing to be done, isn't there, with all of our health care? Uh, yeah, and that's going to be a big challenge for Labour and when they win the election, because <gasps> they will. If they win the election, no, Andrew I'm not, even, I'm not even bothering to say if, <laughs> when. It's, it's by how much. Now, Nigel Farage, our very own, he's in Florida, where he's interviewed Donald Trump. Listen to this snippet from the interview, which airs tonight at 7pm, where the former president tells of his sympathy for the late Queen Mother over how she was treated by Harry and Meghan. Uh, she, you know, I would say, although she wouldn't show it because she was strong and smart, mm. but I would imagine they broke her heart. The things that they were saying were so bad and so horrible. And uh, she was in her 90s and hearing this stuff. I, I think they broke her heart. No, I it think, was horrible. I think they it really hurt her very but bad. But if he's, if he's lied on his visa form, you know, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't I mean, the truth need to come out? We'll have I to. mean, should, should he get special privileges that nobody else does? No, and we'll have to see uh, if they know something about the drugs, and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Mm, you would. But I thought they were very disrespectful to the family, to mm. the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I thought the Queen was incredible. I mean, think of it. All those years, 75 years, she, she's almost never made a mistake. Right. It's, it's, okay. it's almost unbelievable. Well, for more of that this evening, including Trump's approach to foreign policy, yeah. make sure you tune in to GB News this evening at 7 o'clock tonight. It is being edited as we speak. Nigel Farage is not even back in the country yet. It is hot off the press. I'm going to be glued to it. Yeah, me too. Well, joining us now from Chicago is the chief ethics lawyer uh, during George Bush's George W. Bush's administration, Richard Painter. Richard, morning. Um, are you hang? Will you be hanging on every word that Donald Trump has to say in that interview with us later? Well, I look forward to uh, seeing it. I didn't catch. That. I didn't catch that, George. Sorry, um, sorry, Richard. I very much look forward to seeing that interview. What, what significance will it have in America? Obviously, it's a big deal here. We've got Nigel Farage, a very well-known uh, face and name in this country. But will it have an impact over in America? I, I don't know. It's a different system here, uh, where the, uh, the royal family in the United Kingdom is very important for uh, leading the country in uh, personality and in many ways. But the political decisions are uh, uh, almost all made by the parliament and the prime minister. And here, uh, the uh, cult of personality that Donald Trump has managed to surround himself with in order to get elected, which is true of just about every president, uh, has some very disturbing qualities to it. Uh, and uh, Americans are worried uh, that if Donald Trump becomes president again, uh, he will become an authoritarian, uh, that the world leaders that he admires uh, are not uh, uh, people like the royal family of the United Kingdom, uh, but those like uh, Vladimir Putin and dictators. Uh, he has spoken too often uh, with a rhetoric uh, of a dictator about uh, the power of the presidency. Uh, and combining that with his uh, pending criminal charges, uh, a lot of them are relating to the fact that he was unwilling to cede power when he lost an election. Uh, we are very, very concerned about Donald Trump. So if we were to analogize him to anyone in British history, we might think about Oliver Cromwell uh, or someone who uh, sought to uh, uh, really uh, use uh, the uh, Republican form of government uh, to seize power and exercise it in a, a dictatorial way. Uh, and uh, that's not what this country wants. Uh, so before we get to ed discussing any of the issues, we need to think about the character of the president uh, and that we have to have a president who is accountable to the Constitution and who doesn't think of himself as above the Constitution, above the rule of law. And sadly, what we saw in uh, January of uh, 2021 uh, was quite to the contrary. What about all the criminal charges that are mounting up against him Richard, I mean, will, if, if he can deflect those before the presidential election, even if he's then found guilty, is it right he can absolutely pardon himself, which is something that could never happen in this country? Well, he could try to pardon himself. I don't think a self-pardon would be valid. 
Uh, but if he becomes president of the United States, he will supervise the Justice Department. And so then all he needs to do is appeal the federal cases as a uh, appeal them to the appellate courts. And then the Justice Department uh, simply defaults and gives up the case. And so the federal cases, the federal charges uh, uh, will almost certainly disappear if Donald Trump becomes the next president in January. Uh, the state charges, the state cases, that's a little bit more complex. Uh, but we see the situation in Georgia spiraling out of control. Uh, we hope that that case should certainly go to trial. Uh, we should be focusing on the conduct of Donald Trump, not the prosecutor. Uh, but uh, that case is delayed very much. The New York case may proceed the trial in the next month or two, and we'll see what comes out of that. It's interesting to hear you talk about the character of a president and how that's important, because from where we're sitting on the other side of the pond, President Biden appears to have immense difficulties fulfilling the obligations of being a president satisfactorily. Yes, a lot of Americans would like to see a choice between, quite frankly, two younger candidates. Uh, that's one of the, the many concerns here. Uh, and uh, uh, not every American is going to go to the polls. Uh, these are their, first, their favorite choices in either political party. Uh, the uh, system for choosing the nominee of both the Democratic and the Republican Party uh, certainly needs some fixing. Uh, we saw that in 2016, a lot of Republicans opposed Donald Trump and felt strongly that he should not receive the nomination for president. Uh, I was one of them. I was a Republican for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the Republicans had uh, elected anybody else, I think they would have ended up serving two terms, and Joe Biden wouldn't be there. Uh, the Democrats have problems with their primary process as well. Yeah. An incumbent president has enormous power over uh, the political apparatus of his party. And we're seeing with Donald Trump that even a former uh, president has uh, enormous power over the political apparatus of his party. And that means that challengers, primary challengers, are very, very unlikely to succeed in either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. The people in, in Britain, um, it must be said, I'm, I'm sure all around the world, are saying the same thing. How is it in a country the size of the United States, a population of nearly 340 million, the most powerful country in the world, it's the best you can offer? Trump and Biden, that's it? Well, part of the problem is in the primaries, uh, very few voters show up. Uh, and the voters who show up in the Republican primary are extremely loyal to the Republican um, establishment, which uh, now is going to be subtly behind Donald Trump. Uh, he was the former president of the United States. The same thing in the in the Democratic Party. We had a very uh, uh, talented uh, young congressman, uh, Dean Phillips from Minnesota, run against Joe Biden. Uh, and he received only two and a half or three percent of the vote uh, in the Democratic primaries, and now he has dropped out. What do you uh, so this uh, is a system that very much needs fixing. I think it's tied to the amount of money that's in politics on both the Democratic side and the Republican side, uh, the way campaign finance that is handled in this country. You have an enormous mm. war chest for both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and now they're going to use that money against each other in November. OK, all right, we've run out of time. Uh, Richard Painter, thank you so much for joining us, a chief ethics lawyer during George W. Bush's administration. It is a terrible choice, isn't it? What, both of them? Yeah, I mean, it could have been a bit of a variety. It's just extraordinary. It is extraordinary. But that's because of the sort of dynastic way yeah. that American politics always yeah. works. You can't really Problem break through, can system. you? Um, it is. Uh, let us know your thoughts uh, this morning. What would you want to hear from Donald Trump tonight? And uh, also still to come, the new James Bond, Aaron Taylor Johnson. We believe it's going to be him. It hasn't been 100% confirmed, but it's looking very, very likely. Would he get your vote? This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right. We all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful. But what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse. That is the campaign. 
there's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they commit a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay. They show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be. There should be a penalty for that. For the same you. reason, You're if you are obliged to, use if you it. Commit, there's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is no. But there is an offer because at there the end of the day, like you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, that's an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Eleven twenty with Britain's Newsman TV News Andrew Pearson, Pep Turner, the panel are back. Our senior political commentator Nigel Nelson and GP and medical writer Donny, Dr. Annie Hunterkamp. Right, the Princess of Wales has been seen. I know, I know, I know. Stop groaning at home. It's on the front page of the paper. We were worried about her. There's all of these all around theories the world be on the front page. about where she'd gone, and now we have some video of her walking along, looking okay after her abdominal Great. surgery. Great. Now leave her alone. I really do feel this. I think they should leave this poor girl alone, uh, woman the, alone. To, 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 to interrupt you briefly, the Sun had a headline last week on the front page saying, "Leave her alone." Yeah. Th they broke the story <laughs> yesterday that she was at the Windsor. Farm shop, and they've got <laughs> on the, they've got the video today. I'm sure that was probably quite a staged visit to the farm shop, and was. someone at the Sun knew. But having said that, I just can't believe that we are so. We're not learning from the past, are we? The pressure that we put on Diana, and look where that led. And now we're putting the same pressure on this young woman. She said she's ill. She said she'd be back after Easter. Leave her alone before she does something really bad. It is quite different, though, isn't it, Nigel? I would say. Um, yes, we are all slightly obsessed with her, but it is a very different relationship that the press have with the royal family than they did when Diana was alive. Oh, yeah. I mean, but, uh, well, Diana changed everything. I yeah. mean, because of what happened to Diana, um, the press very much pulled back from the royal family there. I mean, I think that what Kate did is actually really important, that um, putting that picture out, picture out on Mother's Day just made the conspiracy theories go completely wild. Yeah. And there's some horrible stuff on, on social is. media um, uh, about her. So here we have a picture, not doctored in any, in any way, which is great, showing, showing her smiling, showing her looking OK. I just think it was absolutely essential they did that. So they've, they've, they've got a step right, having, made, having put, a, put a foot wrong previously. And what? they would have known, sorry, but, but they'd have known... Being mm -hmm. there, that somebody, mm -hmm. somebody was going know. to film them yeah, or I mean, I mean, photograph them. If it wasn't actually arranged, yeah. they was, <laughs> it, it was yeah. certainly certainly managed. But um, if you don't put something like that out there, uh, all you're going to do is just encourage the conspiracy theorists to come up with ever more. It hasn't stopped them though, apparently. Yeah, it has. Some people are saying it's not her. But what do you mean? Well, just, just. I think this is important. What do you mean by conspiracy theorists? Well, I mean, I'm not going to say what the conspiracies are, but there are. But um, what social media has been running with is what has happened. 
happened to Kate, um, whether she's actually still alive. Mm -hmm. um, it's been really horrible stuff. And there's a whole load of other ideas of what might have happened to her. Correct. I, I, I just, I just, I, oh, people no. bandy that phrase around, and I always think it's important to clarify what you mean because actually, a lot of people have just got no trust, and there is a yeah. spectrum of theorising. Yeah. Some people think she's been abducted by Martians, right. and some people think she's having a, a, a yeah. breakdown well, of a more of a mental I, health I condition. I think it's a journalist either Spain or Sweden has had to apologise for saying on a television programme. I know authoritatively she's yeah. in a coma. Absolutely. Completely untrue. Yeah. And this is a newspaper. But this is because there's no trust. Well, it's also that when there's a void, people yeah. will fill it, in whatever circumstances we're in. And I've actually seen this morning that now the spotlight has been turned on William in that picture because he allowed her to carry a bag. Yeah. What kind of man is he? Do we want him as our future king? Well, it's this only, is how crazy people are. been to the bread shop. I mean, it wouldn't have been that heavy, that heavy, would it? I know, unless yeah. it was a lot of dough. <laughs> I don't I think just, they do. People just haven't got but I too much time on their hands. I was but just going to say that. But I think that. he was holding the bag of shopping as well just to show, and look, I can carry my own shopping too. I know. I think but you can was, never win, can you? Was, yeah, I think it was contrived down to the last bit of the photo. She was smiling, he yeah, had his hat it would do, but, I, but knowing how um, badly the palace behaved over the Mother's Day picture, you wonder how good the aides actually are, because mm. somebody should have spotted... Do you think they behaved badly? Well, I do, on the basis that... Um, it, even if Kate didn't know about the about the way the modern day media works, the aide certainly should. Well, she that, does really. Well, no, she doesn't. But I, well, I don't think she, there's any reason why she should. The, the, that pictures have always been manipulated. Yeah. Um, they're airbrushed or whatever just to make them look a bit better. But AI means you can create a completely fresh image which can be totally false. Yeah. So, at the moment, picture agencies now won't take anything that is doctored, quite mm. rightly, for that reason. The aides should have known that. They also... The, 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 if there was one problem I had with the photograph last week, to go back to it, was why on earth did they allow it to go out without her rings on? Because that was always going to trigger yeah. all the speculation. Oh, she may, they may have been off because she's lost weight and we can see she's lost weight because she's had an operation. Do you know what? I looked at that picture when I first saw it and I thought, oh, what a lovely picture. Mm. And that was the end of my thought process. You know, what, we've now reached this stage where everything must be wrong, but you're right, it is when you, you destroy people's trust. And when you see the BBC, what they've done today with the Islamabad story, yeah. you destroy people's trust. They're not going to trust anything. And I'm not sure we can ever recover the trust. I agree. We were talking about that actually yeah. off air earlier. I said, no, there's such a huge contingent of people now who don't trust the government, they don't trust the media, they don't trust our regulatory authorities. And I feel like that fracturing of that, that sort of social contract, actually, between the public and those people who have more power than us yeah. has gone completely. Gone completely. And we see it in all areas of life. We see it between the p police and the public. People don't trust them anymore because of things that have happened there, Sarah Everard. And we're just seeing it in every area. We're seeing it with our health services because of what happened in COVID. The police, because of that... The royal family now, people are losing their trust, and who would have thought yeah. we would have been sitting here saying people have lost their trust in the royal family? I still trust them. I still love them. I, I do, what, too. The royal family? Yeah, I love them. You the don't, family. do you? I do. I, I, I don't trust anyone anymore, either. I'm a little bit... You know, I've become super skeptical. But um, I, I do, I think, we need the royal family 100%. We really do. They are the identity. If we are looking at a gradual erosion of nation-states across the world, we need our royal family mm. because they are... They define Even our Even you parents. agree with that now. Well, no, I'm not a royalist. I'm a monarchist. <laughs> so what I think we actually need is our head of state. And the head of state should be the monarch. So right. that's where I come from. So would you just have have a monarch and that's it? No, I mean, you're going to have a family around, around him. The, the point is that I, I'm not enthralled to the royal family as a royal family. Right. I am in... But I do believe in the position of the head of state the being hereditary and being the monarch. You don't want yes. some boring old grey ex-politician. Correct. Yeah, like Tony Blair. <laughs> Yeah, correct. Um, no, I don't want Tony Blair as, uh, as head of state. No, no, not at all. I bet he'd love it. Um, so let's talk about Labour while we're on that topic. Rachel Reese is going to be talking tonight. She's going to be delivering the, the May lecture in the City of London, Nigel. How significant is it at this stage in election year, what she says? It's a big one because um, there's a tradition of um, chancellors and future chancellors making these speeches to um, the business community. What she'll, she'll talk about is that she wants a partnership with business, very sort of new Labourish, really. 
really. The bit she won't talk about, which she's going to have to talk about at some point, is how she's going right. to fund her economic policies yeah. now that we've lost the 28 billion green growth fund, uh, which was uh, which would have actually grown the economy. And she killed and it off. And she's and she killed that off in, indeed. And the Tories nicking her policy of 2.7 billion for non-DOMs. She says we can still have two million extra uh, NHS operations a year. Uh, I think she's going to have to explain how that's going to be funded. She's not going to do that in the speech tonight, then. No, she's not. And I, I can't help but feel that if the £27 billion was going to grow the economy, they wouldn't have dumped it. Um, I think, from what I've seen, it's a leaked speech. Everything's leaked now. Why yeah. can't we just wait and have things when they happen so we get the headlines tomorrow? But it looks like a very dull speech. I yeah. think you're right, Andrew. Really dull. And, you know, she keeps repeating. It's just like word salad. You know, we're going to unlock businesses and see the potential for growth, but no actual detail on what that really means when you've got businesses who have got the highest corporation tax that we've mm. ever had so the small businesses the backbone of this country are crippled many yeah. of them going out of business you've got their new employment laws which they may well drop but at the moment are going to impose another massive cost on businesses with you, you won't be able to fire anybody or just be like France you know and you'll have no zero hour contracts that some people quite like and I just don't see how any of this is going to develop into the growth that we definitely She's need deliberately setting out to be dull. That's her... That She's is, done That it. is the policy. <laughs> that is what... I'm right, aren't well, I? You don't, have to, you don't dull, have to do anything at the moment. boring. Yeah, I mean... And the, that's what they're trying to do. It, it, that, as the days go on, it becomes more and more likely the Tories are yeah. finished. Therefore, you, for the Labour Party, you just boring not dull. make any mistakes. That's right. She has said that the NHS is due a massive overhaul, and it is. They so won't do it. If they're they brave enough to do it... radical. And they are going to have to be radical. If majority to 150, they could. Yeah, exactly. But with um, the money, they could do the two million extra ops by paying doctors and nurses to work overtime. There are so and many that... doctors, though, and there are already lots of them are doing overtime or working in the private sector. Mm. I well, think there's a limit. It would be nice to get me. them back into the public sector so they could bring the waiting list down. Yeah. <laughs> um, James Bond. Yes, can we quickly, before we run out of time, we go to Sophia with the news. Um, we've got this new James Bond. It sounds like, Renee, not 100% confirmed, but very much looking that way. Aaron Taylor-Johnson... Are you a fan? Do you even know who he is? Didn't is know who right he choice? was, but I'm not the right person to ask, really, because I'm not a great, as you know, TV watcher. However, I have had a look at him. He's very pleasing on the eye. Yeah. I think he fits the bill of James Bond. Mm. I think we've we've stayed with the character as Fleming yeah. actually wrote it, and I think that has to be a good thing. Yeah. Because it could have been a woman or a trans person or someone. Oh, so... oh not a trans <laughs> James Bond. Well, probably not. <laughs> but, um, no, the, Are you the, disappointed the, the, it's a white man? Pardon? Are you disappointed it's a white man? I think it, I think it ought to be a white man. I think it should, should go... As near to the book as possible. Um, this particular James Bond looks more like the villain than the hero that he oh, should be. That's interesting. I wish they'd gone for James Norton. He's a bit edgy. James Norton Very from charming. Happy Valley on yeah, ITV. Yeah. He was the baddie in Happy Valley. Yeah. He would have also have been outstanding, actually. Yeah, well, I, I, have, I like I, him. Yeah, yeah. Gets my vote. He's got a much older wife. Uh, right. Uh, thank you both, Renee and Nigel. Now, moving on. Britain's roads are crumbling to pieces. Pothole numbers have reached an eight-year high. I would have thought it's the highest number Ever, ever. Yeah, never yeah. mind eight years. And you know what, Tories, this is the bread and butter stuff that people want sorted, and it what hasn't been. What they're saying. Right, that and more after your morning's news with Sophia Wensler. Bev, thank you. It's 11.32. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your headlines. Former US President Donald Trump has hinted he could deport Prince Harry if he wins the election. In an exclusive interview with Nigel Farage, he said the Duke of Sussex won't get special privileges if he lied on his visa about drug use. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. And you can see that full interview on Farage tonight from 7 p.m. The Prime Minister hopes the first group of illegal migrants will be on a flight to Rwanda in the spring after the government overturned all amendments to a bill submitted by the House of Lords. It will now go back to peers who have been accused of trying to wreck the legislation. They could now push for other changes, which means the bill faces more delays before the Easter recess. Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. 
The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils are expected to fix 2 million potholes in the current financial year. That's up 43% on the previous year and the highest annual total since 2015. And the Princess of Wales has been filmed smiling and looking happy while out shopping with Prince William. It comes after the couple have faced weeks of social media speculation surrounding Catherine's health and whereabouts. Now the Sun newspaper has published the pictures and a video of Prince William and Princess Catherine strolling through a car park on Saturday at a Windsor farm shop. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For exclusive, limited edition and rare gold coins that are always newsworthy, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2685 and €1.1697. The price of gold is £1,698.47 and pence per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,704 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Right up at noon, good afternoon, Britain, with Emily and Tom. What have you got on the show today? Oh, we've got an absolute smorgasbord of <laughs> stories today, Bev. Not least oh, looking word. ahead <laughs> towards uh, Nigel Farage's big, oh, yeah. big interview Can't tonight. Wait. Got a little clip or two to show of that ahead of the main event. But also, some other big stories affecting the UK too. Have you heard of this church in Devon? that's been told it can't ring its... For 150 I years. Have. Yeah. It's outrageous. It's been ringing its bells. And one complaint. <laughs> yeah. One complaint overturns 150 years Shocking. of history. This don't isn't live the first... in a country if you don't want a church bell Well, don't you think this isn't the first church that's had its bells silenced because no. of, you know, a tiny minority of complaints. So I believe we're going to be down in Devon asking some residents and local Very people good. whether mm. they're, they've ever been bothered by these bells. I imagine, now I don't know, but I imagine it was an outsider who'd moved yeah, to the village that's what mine and is. they're not used to the bells mm. ringing and so they've com made, a, made this complaint. But this is the state of modern Britain, isn't it? Really? It shows the problem with just about everything. If you, if you don't want to sort of have a noisy existence, maybe don't live in the centre of a city. Quite. For example, there, is, there are complaints that go on in the centre of London from people who live in the poshest flats in the world saying yeah, yeah. the pub can't open beyond 10 o'clock because then I can't get to sleep. Well, get some double glazing. Then. Yeah, they could afford it. It's no, this it noisy, can. tyrannical minority that mm. seem to win but, every but time. But why has, mm. why has the yeah. church been forced to give in? That's a sad thing. Well, is it because they just couldn't put up with even one complaint? Did they not like the bells themselves ringing all night? <laughs> but a 150-year mm. tradition, just yeah. to end because of one... So we're going to be complaint. speaking to as many locals Good. as we can on well this done. issue. But, of course, there is much more besides. The Reform Party has had an official apology today from sure the that. BBC. Yeah. The BBC, in an article about reform, called it a far-right party. A far right party, With and they've the... issued a grovelling yeah. apology. Yeah. So we're going to speaking to Richard Tice on yeah, that yeah. too, Great. and see what he has Great. to say. Because we know exactly what they're saying about far right: nasty, mm. extreme, racist, mm. the usual stuff. Right, shocking. Thank you both. That will be Emily and Tom from midday until three o'clock this afternoon. For now, though, you're with Britain's newsroom. We've not quite finished with you on GB News. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9 p.m. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice 
to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. morning it's 11 39 you're with britain's newsroom on gb news with andrew pierce and bev turner these emails and texts you do not like draper do you glynn says this is the former well he's first minister of wales until today after five years glynn says draper is standing down today thank the lord labor has destroyed my country devolution has failed i want another referendum on it asap and um, Hugh echoes that drakeford has done absolutely zero for the people of wales they've done nothing but let us down Potholes are getting you wound up. John says potholes are a health and safety issue for cyclists and motor vehicles. We're having to quickly dodge the big holes in the road. I saw a cyclist going over the handlebars because of one the other day. He says Margaret Thatcher wouldn't have allowed this. She'd be turning in her grave. There's a lot she wouldn't have allowed. But isn't that funny, the idea that Margaret Thatcher wouldn't allow this? What's that telling us? That's telling us this idea that there's nobody competent, capable and prepared to just get stuff done. Uh, and, and I absolutely think potholes is so important. It is such a bread and butter issue. It, it infuriates. I mean, my local paper is full of it. And also just the fact that we then have roadworks that seem to last for six weeks around one pothole. Just fix them. Just fix them. Now, let's do the great debate about James Bond. Is it going to be Aaron... What's his name? Um, he's called already. Aaron taylor John. Johnson, uh, married to Sam Taylor Johnson, formerly Sam 33. Taylor Wood. He was in some of the Marvel films and he was in... Dunno. Can't remember. Matthew says the new James Bond isn't manly enough. He looks if too effeminate and I fear he's going to be a namby-pamby version of Woke. What's happened to our masculine grizzly bear? Actually, Barbara Broccoli, who's in charge of this franchise, she won't allow that. He's quite... He's very manly. What are you talking about? Right. They're talking of manly people who should be uh, James Bond. Debbie has said my ideal James Bond would be Andrew Pearce. <laughs> Because of his gift of the gab, he could talk his way out of anything, and he's one dapper dresser. Not sure I'm particularly butcher masculine, though. You could do your bit for diversity, equity and inclusion and be uh, the first gay yeah, James Bond. Yeah, like I want to <laughs> champion that lot. Listen, <laughs> I, I interviewed Sean Connery. He was terrific. Yeah. And, uh, and I also had a chat with Piers Brosnan. Really great. I, do you know, I, I, I'm going to make a confession. And I met Roger Moore and I loved him. I've never watched a whole James Bond film from start to finish. I didn't watch the last one because I was sick to death of Daniel Craig, boring on and making yeah. it too long. And he was virtue signaling. It was coming more and more woke. All the, look, it's a bit of fun, James also, Bond, isn't it? It is a bit of fun. It will be interesting, though, to see if the, the new one, with if, if this guy is 100% the, the lead in it. I, I think see he is. what direction it goes in terms of its writing. Um, loads of you, again, in the, uh, talking about potholes. Renee says, here in the north, potholes are repaired by blobs which aren't smoothed over. When you said they're repaired by blobs, I thought you what, meant the men the... working in a high-vis. 
I think she, <laughs> which means by a blob of tarmac. Could be women. Which isn't smoothed over. What is the point? Good point. You see, you're doing a bit for DEI again. There we are. Uh, staff need training. It does not help the shock observers or suspension. Sure. Shock observers? I was thinking she meant people stood by the yeah. road looking on in shock. Sorry. Sure. Now, <laughs> Nigel Farage, our very own, he's in Florida where he's interviewed former President Donald Trump. That's right. It's an old holds barred interview. Here's a little look. Join me tonight at 7 o'clock on GB News. The full interview with Donald J. Trump. And he makes it absolutely clear. He's running. He believes that he is going to win. Prince Harry may not be able to stay in America if Trump gets elected. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. He's accused the court of a bloodshed if he loses. But actually, the context of that is all completely and utterly wrong. It's going to be a terrible bloodbath for the auto industry. The United Auto Workers, it's going to be put out of business. And importantly, for global security, we get tonight the definitive answer of where Trump stands on NATO. This has global significance. Why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money, but now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two or three weeks ago? This is an interview you will not want to miss tonight, exclusively on GB News at 7 o'clock. Join me worst contributors on defence is Germany, which used to be the richest, most powerful country in yeah. Europe. They're shockers, as are France. Well, I'm sure they will we talk about our, that. We make our NATO contribution. I do have to say, with the passage of time, I do find it refreshing to hear the things that Donald Trump says now. I like the fact that, I mean, when, you know, he famously said, didn't he, term, his first term in office, he was going to drain the, drain the swamp. The idea that there was an establishment and he was outside of that and would change it, get rid of some of the corruption, perhaps, in Washington. And I, I, I'm very much on board with that idea now. And if it's a choice between, I'm sorry, um, Biden, who just can't oh. hold it together. Look, I was told by a very authoritative Democrat, five hours a day maximum, that's now. What would we like in six months' time? And when he's president of the United States, hang on, you're on duty 24-7. Yeah. You could be woken up at any minute of any day. Absolutely. So that was Mar-a-Lago you saw there. That's where the interview uh, was conducted. Between I'm going to be glued to it. Farage and Trump. Um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing it. There'll be clips, a few little clips, with um, Tom and Emily as well uh, this afternoon between 12 and 3. Still to come now, though, the nation's roads are crumbling. You've been getting in touch with it about it all morning. We're going to talk to a campaigner who's going to tell us what they think about the state of our roads and why we've got to this situation at all. You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Bit of rain around this morning, first thing, but most of us will have a, a kind of brightening up sort of day with some bright or sunny spells later and not too much rain by this afternoon. Even this morning, the rain is fairly well scattered, but some pretty heavy showers across northern Scotland with a gusty wind and a smattering of showers over parts of England and Wales, particularly the Midlands, North East England. We'll see a few more of those through the afternoon, but I'm hopeful for something a bit brighter for uh, Wales, Western Scotland, and even further south, there'll be some bright spells, which could see temperatures get to 16, 17, maybe 18 Celsius. So that's pretty mild for the time of year. Feeling colder with a stiff wind over the far north of Scotland. That'll ease a little as we go through the nights and then more rain comes into Wales and southwest England. So things turning damp here through the evening. That rain will spread into the Midlands and Northern Ireland as we go through the night and eventually into southern Scotland. With all the cloud and the outbreaks of mostly light rain, won't be a cold night. Temperatures in the south staying in double figures in some towns and cities. A dull, dank, drizzly start then for Wednesday morning, certainly over the Midlands, North Wales, Northern Ireland and Southern Scotland. Most of the south, again, largely dry. And much of northern Scotland having a fine day on Wednesday. Some decent spells of sunshine for the highlands. Brightening up too across northern Ireland. Elsewhere, the rain will tend to ease, but many places will stay fairly cloudy tomorrow. A cooler day as a result, but still pretty mild in the southeast. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 
I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Uh, Britain's crumbling roads, we've been talking about them a lot today. They've reached record breaking point, literally. Pothole numbers have reached an eight year high. So, a report has found that just 47% of local road miles were rated as being in a good condition. So, joining us now is Rick Green, who's chairman of the ASF. Asp Read it for me. Asphalt. As Asphalt Industry Alliance, who carried out the research. Asphalt. It's not a word I use very often, that, I'm afraid. Right, Rick, what's happened to our roads and why are they in such a state? The, uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, I think it's a, a long-term serial underinvestment is the answer. Uh, th this this has been going on now for three decades of underinvestment in local roads, and it's coming to a head. Um, it, it's just the dreadful state of uh, affairs, and and the local roads at the moment are as bad as they've ever been. Awful, isn't it? Who do we? But Rick, who do we blame? Do we blame the Department of Transport, which is in charge of um, roads normally, or is it down to? town halls to fix the roads in their, on their, in their patch, or is it a bit of both? To a certain extent, it's a bit of both. What happens is the funding is uh, provided by DFT uh, to the local authorities, and then the local authorities actually uh -huh. spend the money. So depending on who you talk to, um, you know, there's, there's, there's <laughs> two parties in this, in this game. But, I mean, from where I'm coming from, the local authorities are not receiving enough money from central government um, to maintain the roads. They've got an obligation to keep them safe, and they quite simply are not receiving enough funding do from the DFT to do the job effectively. Rick, can we draw a distinction here between Labour-run councils and Conservative-run councils? No, I, 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 there is no... It, it's just grim everywhere. I mean, I've been talking on some of the local radios this morning and they say, oh, is it worse in the south-west or the north-east or whatever? Is there a north-south divide? There's no real outliers that you'd right. say, oh, look, it, it's because of that. Across the whole of England and Wales, this doesn't include Scotland, but across the whole of England and Wales, the conditions are as bad as they've ever been. We, we heard when the government suspended, um, Rick, the northern extension to HS2, that literally billions more mm. was going to yeah. be diverted from that work into fixing potholes. Well, what's happened to that? Was that a mirage? Because it doesn't... No uh, work appears... Extra work appears to be being done. Well, it, it, the, the number was £8.3 billion pounds that's been diverted from uh, HS2 North. Um, but that is to be spent over the next 11 years. Yeah. And right. Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, uh, suggested that that would be enough to resurface 5,000 miles of roads, which sounds great, doesn't it? You know, that's brilliant, fantastic. And to be fair, we'd be in an even worse position without it. But if you put it into context, 5,000 miles of roads, the whole network is 200,000 miles. Oh. So therefore, it's mm. only actually 2.5% and that's over 11 years. So per year, it's less than one quarter of percent of the network is going to be resurfaced. So by the time you get to the end of the 10 years, Rick, you'll have to start again because um, you won't <laughs> do all the other bits you haven't done. 
Yeah, um, yeah, you're absolutely right, Andrew. That 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 is in, indeed the case. That you know, roads wear out. They're not designed to last forever. But you've got to maintain them, otherwise we get into the state where we are now. Rick, is there a problem with the standards of repair? Because anecdotally, I've seen potholes appear. Suddenly there's cones round, the road's closed for days and nobody ever seems to be working there. They fix it and then guess what? Two weeks later, there's another hole in the road. I, I, personally, I don't think so. I mean, what, what happens is the, the local authorities and the contractors that um, they employ in order to maintain the roads have this obligation to keep the road safe. So what happens if a pothole appears, often they will do a temporary fix, which is, I think, probably what you've seen there. Right. And then when they can program and organise the road closure and whatever, they'll come and do a permanent fix. Now, the permanent fixes to these potholes are, are, are normally quite good. In fact, often what you'll see is where a pothole has been fixed. Actually, that's still intact two years later, mm. but the road around it is crumbling. OK, and what can people do, Rick? We've had some of our viewers messaging this morning to say, if you see a pothole, ca contact the council, tell them where it is, and they will have an obligation to come and fix it. And, and that's correct, and, and they will. It depends how deep it is and where it is in the road and what kind, what type of road it is. But, yeah, they, they should contact the local authority who have this obligation to come and fix it. OK, all right. I well, mean, the other thing the public could do is, you know, write to their local councillors, write to their local MPs and try and get some, you know, groundswell of public opinion to say mm. we've had enough of this. Well, we've had enough of it, Rick, and sadly we've had to have yeah. enough of you now because we've run out of time, but thank you so much, thank Rick you very Greenay, much. who is the chairman Cheers. of the Asphalt Industry Alliance. It's so much more interesting than I thought it was going to be with a title like that. Yeah, and he carried out that research. Almost half of our roads, massive potholes. Yeah. Scandalous. Right. right, that is it from us this morning. Up next, good afternoon, Britain, with Tom and Emily. We'll see you tomorrow. See you then. The BBC apologises for a glaring error. It's branded the third most popular political party in the United Kingdom far right. Yes, we'll be speaking to the Reform UK leader Richard Tice about what he makes of the BBC's grovelling apology. And would you pay more tax, even more tax, to save the NHS? Well, now a majority of us say we absolutely would not. Has the NHS lost its sacred cow? status. All of that after your weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, welcome to the GB News forecast from the Met Office. Following the rain overnight, we're going to see a lot of cloud today and further showers, but actually there will still be some drier and brighter interludes out there. We've got weather fronts clearing into the North Sea, another set of fronts lining up for overnight, but in between, for the afternoon, we've got a legacy of cloud cover, especially across the south and southeast. Some brighter spells emerging, but also quite a number of showers. The showers scattered, but I think they'll be focused across southwest England, into parts of the Midlands, as well as northern parts of East Anglia into Lincolnshire. Away from the showers, where we do get some sunshine coming through, feeling warm once again in the southeast, 17 Celsius, much cooler further north, 9 or 10 for Scotland. Although in Scotland, plenty of sunny spells. We'll keep the clear spells and the uh, mostly dry weather in the north of Scotland overnight. Likewise, for the far southeast, it stays largely dry, but elsewhere, cloud increasing, outbreaks of rain turning up. Of course, the cloud and the rain keeps the temperatures from falling away, so 9 or 10 Celsius for many of us as we start off Wednesday. Although the far northwest of Scotland will see a touch of frost where the skies are clearest, and that's where the brightest weather will be on Wednesday, western and northwest Scotland. And then after a damp start, Northern Ireland as well. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover and outbreaks of rain continuing through parts of northern and central England, Wales and the southwest. Feeling warm though in the southeast. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. 